the uh, meeting to order. This is the uh, Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board meeting of Tuesday, March 25th, 2014. Um, the first order of business is to approve the minutes of February 25th, 2014. Um, first, is there any uh, discussion or comment on these minutes? Not hearing any comments or uh, discussion issues raised. Um, anybody would like to make a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of February 25th, 2014 ZBA meeting. Any seconds? Second. Mike seconds. All in favor? So the uh, minutes from the February 25th, 2014 meeting have been approved five to nothing. <laughs> Uh, I don't believe there's any old business um, pending before the board, so we'll now move on to uh, the new business. And uh, the first issue in front of the board for today is uh, number one, to hear the request of Harold and Mary Friedman of 36 Surf Road to appeal the code enforcement officer's decision to grant a temporary partial certificate of occupancy for the project at 40 Surf Road map U5, lot 42, that is being constructed under building permit 109994. My name is Martha Gaithwaite and I represent Harold and Mary Friedman who live at 36 Surf Road. I think some of you folks were here when we were here a year ago appealing the issuance of the permit um, and I We'll just go through some of the procedural history for those of you who were not here the last time. We're here because on June 8, 2012, unbeknownst to my clients, a permit was issued for work on a non-conforming structure on a non-conforming lot at 40 Surf Road. My clients were not aware of the building permit being issued and did not find out about it until early October 2012 when they saw workmen show up at the site. They immediately approached their neighbors, the Mallories, who own the property at 40 Surf Road, asked them what the project was about, asked them to stop the project until there was an opportunity to have the permit reviewed. They also filed an appeal here and the decision of the board at the time was that because the appeal had not been filed within 30 days, we needed to go to the Superior Court and ask for permission of the judge to come back here so you would reach a substantive um, review. That matter is still pending in the Superior Court. What has happened in the meantime is uh, in November, a temporary certificate of occupancy was issued for this project. We filed a timely appeal of that certificate of occupancy and we are challenging it on two grounds. The first ground is for the reasons that we were challenging the permit to begin with back a year ago and I understand procedurally that's before the Superior Court and you folks probably cannot decide the issues surrounding the normal high water mark and the improper issuance of the permit to begin with, but I'd be happy to talk to you about those issues if anybody has questions about them. The narrow issue that we're here about tonight, however, concerns the issuance of the certificate of occupancy and actually underscores my client's concerns with this whole process and why we are here tonight. What happened in October of 2012 is that when my clients saw workmen at the property, they, in addition to going next door to their neighbors, came here to the town office to ask for a copy of the building permit and the application. They were provided with materials from a project that had happened in 2006, and um, then they found out that Mr. Smith was on administrative leave. Mr. Smith was the former code enforcement officer, 
and they tried to contact him to find out exactly what had been permitted and because it was an administrative leave he could not respond to their questions. Eventually um, the town found what was presented to be the permit that had been issued for this project. The file, however, in the town office contains very little information with respect to actually what Mr. Smith was looking at when he issued that permit. As part of the Superior Court proceedings, we've had the opportunity to depose Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith has testified under oath that in May or June of 2012, at the time he issued the permit, he had been spoken to by Mr. McGovern, who expressed concerns about his job performance and suggested that he should not be employed as a code enforcement officer. Apparently, Mr. Smith stayed on the job until October when the decision was made that he would go out on administrative leave. I do not know the specifics beyond what Mr. Smith testified to, but I do know that he testified that in May or June, at the time that this permit was issued, he had been told that he was not performing his job and he should be um, looking for work elsewhere. That may explain why we don't have anything in the file. All I can tell you is that when the certificate of occupancy was issued, last November, we went back to the town office to try to find out exactly what was on file now. What is on file with the town office is a building permit application. You have a uh, portion of that building permit application in the materials that are provided as part of the board packet. Um, what you don't have, and if I might just provide to you, this is part of the town file, but it's page two of the permit application. I think in your board packet you have pages one, three, and four. In the application that was submitted for this permit, the representation was made by the owner and the owner's builder that there would be no change in the footprint of the structure, that it would stay within the existing footprint. The representation was also made that there would be no addition of bedrooms. A permit was then issued. You do have a copy of that permit in your file materials. What's interesting to note is that the permit that was issued refers to a permit application that is not the permit application that is in the town files and that was represented to us as being the permit application that supports the permit. Um, so we don't really know when this permit refers to application number 12-00319, what that means. Um, we've been told that the 434 permit uh, is the operative application. So there's a significant question about exactly what Mr. Smith was reviewing, what Mr. Smith approved, and there's no question, however, that what is out there now and for which a certificate of occupancy has been issued is different than what the town files say is authorized. And I can um, have my clients testify or I can make the representation to you that there is now a new porch in the, on the structure that is outside the existing footprint. In addition to that, there is a new stair tower and foundation built that is outside of the existing footprint. It is my understanding from the town files that the certificate of occupancy is allowing the occupancy of two new bedrooms, which again is different than the representation made in the application in front of you. In addition to that, this is a non-conforming structure on a non-conforming lot that does not even meet the minimum bulk standards under your ordinance. Specifically, a portion of the structure is within nine feet of the property line. 
it has been and remains our position that a code enforcement officer has no authority to issue any type of permit or certificate of occupancy for a structure that is beyond or within those um, absolute limits that are set by your ordinance. The absolute limit set by your ordinance is 10 feet. This is within 9 feet, and I believe that's undisputed that it's within 9 feet. So our position is that the code enforcement officer didn't have authority to issue the permit to begin with, but if we're not going to talk about that because it's subject of an appeal with the Superior Court, at least he does not have authority to issue a certificate of occupancy for a structure that is that non-conforming. But to make matters worse, as part of the construction of this project, we have the builder building into the nine-foot setback in order to create this um, dormer effect. And I have photos of that um, for the board to look at. Um, that is the picture of a portion of the wall that is within the uh, nine feet. And that picture shows an overhang that was built into the nine feet setback. There's no mention of that in any of the town files. I don't believe there is any reference to it in any of the plans. And I do not understand how a code enforcement officer can approve construction that goes further into the uh, impermissible setback than was already existing. So again, we have a lot of issues with the issuance of the permit, substantive issues. We believe that this project exceeds the limitations set by the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance. I understand that the Mallers are taking the position that they do not want us to discuss that tonight, that we're going to leave that for the Superior Court to decide whether it comes back to you to decide. I don't want to waive that position, and I'm happy to discuss uh, the substantive part of the appeal uh, if you would like to hear it. But for tonight, our major concern is that the town files do not describe accurately the work is, that is out there. The work that is out there does not conform to what is in the town files and there was no basis in our view for a certificate of occupancy to be issued for something that really isn't properly permitted. Um, so I know I've thrown a lot of facts at you, but basically the bottom line is we have a structure that is too close to the property line within the 75 feet normal high water mark on a lot where there is more coverage than allowed by the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance. It exceeds the 30% limitations for volume and square footage. It increases the existing footprint in violation of the representation made in the application. The permit refers to an application that nobody at the town office um, has been able to produce for us. The application that has been produced for us has been violated because we do have uh, an expansion of the existing footprint. So those are just some of the reasons why we're here tonight and why we believe that the code enforcement officer improperly issued the certificate of occupancy on November 13th of 2013. And I'm happy to answer any questions that the board has. Um, I understand that counsel for the Mallory's um, We'll want to have an opportunity to speak and I'd like to have an opportunity to respond to that if it's acceptable to the board but we believe this is a very serious matter that you should be able to go to the town office know what somebody's applied for know what somebody has been permitted to build and then have an assurance that the town has determined that what's out there complies with what was permitted So that's my initial comments. If I'd have the opportunity to uh, speak after you hear from counsel for the Mallory's, I'd appreciate that. Great. 
Thank you. Um, I'd like to hear from the Mallory's Council, and then I'm going to just follow up with Ben just to get some further background about the issuance of the permit. But thank you, Mr. Bannon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I'm Attorney John Bannon, and I'm speaking tonight on behalf of Baird and Leah Mallory in opposition to the Freedmen's Administrative Appeal. I'd like to say this was not, well, this was not where I was going to start, but tonight is the first time I've heard an allegation that the building permit refers to an application that either does not exist or cannot be found or cannot be ascertained in the town's files. If the board looks through the submissions that you've received both from me and from Martha, you'll see repeated references to a particular permit application number. It's reproduced over and over again in these materials. I simply don't know what that's about. I wish I could help you. I also don't know anything about an allegation that there is a dormer that projects into uh, within nine feet of any boundary line. I presume that the Freedmen's or that Attorney Gaithwaite was referring to um, the common boundary line between the Mallory's and the Freedmen's, but this is complete news to me, and as far as I know, that is not accurate at all. To the contrary, the dormer to which uh, Attorney G Gaithwaite was referring um, was purposely stepped back from the non-conforming setback of the existing first floor so that it did not encroach into the setback. That's my understanding of the facts. That's my understanding of what's in the town's file. It, it appears as though the Freedmen's have some frustrations with how the town has been operating its code enforcement office. They're entitled to express those grievances. But the issue here is whether this board has any grounds to invalidate the certificate of occupancy, that the partial certificate of occupancy that the code enforcement officer granted it this year. So let's please treat it, try to keep our eyes on the ball, so to speak. The issue before you tonight is solely, did the code enforcement officer violate the ordinance or make an error or misinterpret the ordinance when he granted the partial certificate of occupancy to allow the Mallory's to occupy two bedrooms? This matter is really quite simply disposed of. There are two decisions by the main Supreme Court that are directly on point. We don't always have that luxury of having case law that's directly on point, but this is one of them. What the law court has said twice and has never said to the contrary is that an appeal from the granting of a certificate of occupancy is not a substitute for an appeal from the granting of the building permit. Therefore, if there is no proper appeal from the granting of the building permit itself, the legitimacy of the building permit is not before the board or the court or anyone else on an appeal from the granting of a certificate of occupancy. Essentially, you must assume the validity of the building permit the issue that you can decide, and that is legitimately before this board, is whether the work that the Mallory's actually did on their house uh, complies with the application materials they submitted to uh, Bruce Smith um, in 2012. And uh, this, this project, I believe, has been monitored since then by uh, Code Enforcement Officer McDougall, so his uh, views are relevant as well. But the, let's, we need, first need to establish what's the database for determining whether what the Mallory's built complies with the building permit. What does that mean? There is not just one source of information that tells you what the building permit 
authorizes. Uh, the Freedmen seem to be suggesting that you must look slavishly at the application for the building permit and really at nothing else. And because in their interpretation, the way the Mallory's builder described whether or not there would be an increase in the number of bedrooms or whether or not there would be an increase in the footprint uh, is the only thing that you should consider. And if there, in fact, is an increase in the number of bedrooms or if there is a change in the existing footprint, then the certificate of occupancy is invalid. That is just plain wrong. What is so obvious it hardly needs saying is that the building permit application requires each applicant to submit with the application plans. Uh, not, you can't just submit that cursory application that is rather cryptic and hard to understand. You have to submit, uh, depending on the, uh, the uh, sophistication of the project, either reasonably detailed plans or very detailed plans. In this case, as I pointed out in my letters, um, the Mallory's architects submitted to Mr. Smith 24 full-size pages of architectural drawings and renderings of this proposed project. There is no allegation. I have seen none. I see none in the papers that the Freedmen's have filed nor what they have said tonight that anything the Mallory's have built departs from the scope of those plans. The plans show what bedrooms were going to be built, and the Mallory's built bedrooms in accordance with those plans. The plans showed a bump out uh, from one small portion of the house for a stairwell. The Mallory's built that stairwell in compliance with the plans. The plans also showed a vestibule or a porch or whatever you want to call it uh, on the front of the house. The Mallory's built that in accordance with the plans. The, the plans in this case are so precise that um, I, I'd like to advert to something that, that Attorney Gaithwaite's comments brought up about this dormer. Um, again, I don't know what she is referring to, but as the project was getting underway, Bruce Smith was careful enough to consider the fact of whether uh, constructing a second story, a second story addition above a non-conforming wall uh, was allowed or not. He took the position, I think correctly, that the second floor addition couldn't encroach into the setback if, if the bottom floor was, was non-conforming, that we needed to step it back to the point where it conformed. So we did, and our architects prepared a new set of plans. Bruce told us to do this. We did it. Uh, we submitted them apparently in November, showing the exact step back that he requested. I'm sure that you will want to confer with your present code enforcement officer about what his opinion is about whether the uh, Mallory's have built their, uh, their structure in, in compliance with the plans but I submit to you that the written materials that have been presented to you by everyone in this case, both sides, provide no evidence that what was built was not in compliance with the plans, which are a signal part, or signal part of the application. And my last point on that, um, that particular issue would be to point out that if the building permit application were paramount, uh, you would expect that that would be what the uh, property owner has to keep on site and post. Uh, if the, uh, I'm sure the board's already familiar with this, but the standard building permit application states that the approved plans must be retained on the job along with the permit until final inspection has been made. It doesn't say anything about maintaining the building permit application on site. Once the permit is granted, the application practically, I'm not saying entirely, but practically falls away or is of virtually minimal importance. What matters is what was shown on the plans and whether the, the property owner complied with them. I think that's a very simple way for the board to dispose of this case. Uh, I uh, would suspect that the board is not anxious to uh, wade into the issues of collateral estoppel or issue preclusion. 
but um, I will simply, I will go through that as briefly as possible and we can explore it more if uh, you see fit. Um, this, is, this, uh, this administrative appeal is now the third time that the Freedmen's have in one way or another challenged the Mallory's building permit. The first time was before this board. The board ruled that that appeal was untimely. As Attorney Gaithwaite mentioned, the Freedmen's filed a Rule 80B appeal from this board's decision uh, challenging its determination that their appeal was untimely. That's number two. Actually, that, oh, no, we've got four. Um, number three is the one that raises the issue with regard to collateral estoppel or issue preclusion. This project needed not just municipal permits, but ones from, or one from the DEP, namely a PBR, a permit by rule, for performing work within 25 feet of a water body. And one of the criteria for granting, for the DEP's ability to grant such a PBR, is whether the proposed project complies with the local shoreland zoning ordinance. So, and, and as I, I think the board is well aware, shoreland zoning is a creature of the state. They have ultimate oversight over shoreland zoning. Um, we often refer to the shoreland zoning coordinators and so forth for their interpretation of shoreland zoning because they're more used to dealing with varied issues than we are. But in, in any event, uh, the DEP is tasked by regulation to determine whether the application that is before it on the PBR conforms with the local shoreland zoning regulation. The Freedmen's were entitled to challenge the PBR by any means they wanted, uh, and many people would perhaps agree with an aggressive strategy of appealing every permit that is granted by any agency or any agent that would facilitate this project. But the problem with doing that is that if the administrative and judicial process is completed as to one of these permits in a manner that is adverse to the Freedmen's and final, the Freedmen's cannot come back here now a fourth time and ask this board to consider whether there was a violation or there was something wrong with the permit when it was originally issued. Uh, as I point out in the materials, uh, Justice Joyce Wheeler of the Superior Court in October of last year, I believe, I don't have the date right in front of me, upheld the DEP's determination after a, a, a very involved and skillfully litigated case on a Rule AC appeal that the DEP correctly found that the project, the Mallory's project, conformed with the Cape Elizabeth zoning ordinance. The Freedmen's did not appeal from the Superior Court's judgment to that effect. And I know we've got quite a few attorneys on the board, and some not, uh, but you who are attorneys know the uh, consequences of not appealing from a, from a Superior Court decision. That is that it becomes final. It becomes immune to challenge in any way, in any other form whether it's another court or an administrative agency or anything else. Therefore, and I'll wrap up this esoteric issue now, because the Superior Court has now issued a final and binding judgment, binding on these parties, that the Mallory Project does comply with the Cape Elizabeth zoning, uh, shoreland jo zoning regulations, there's nothing left for this board ever to decide to the contrary. The, the, the court has spoken, uh, and under the doctrine of collateral estoppel or issue preclusion, you don't get to come back for another bite at the apple. Uh, you get one shot at a court decision, and you have to live with it or appeal it, and the Freedmen's did not. It's too late now. It has been determined judicially and finally that the Mallory's addition complies with the Cape Elizabeth zoning ordinance, and that is the end of the story everywhere in the courts, here, everywhere. And unless the board has questions, I will retire for now.
Thank you. Um, before we return to Attorney Gaithwaite's uh, rebuttal, if we just take a couple seconds to speak with Ben. Um, can you give us some background from your perspective, and at least from my perspective, um, perhaps some of the board members have other questions, but I'm just interested in, in your process and what you did to determine that you should issue the temporary sure. occupancy permit. Uh, first off, this permit was issued seven months prior to me being employed here, so I can't speak to how the permit was issued or what the materials were the permit was issued based upon. Uh, but when I got here, uh, January 22nd of 2013, there, I, there were a set of plans for this project that I assumed to be the approved plans for the project, and I've assumed them to be the approved plans uh, up, up till today and continue. Uh, on May 1st, 2013, I inspected the framing, the plumbing, and the electrical work, and it all passed inspection, and it was consistent with the approved plans. On May 14th, 2013, I inspected the insulation, and the insulation met code requirements. Uh, in November of 2013, Craig Cooper of Rainbow Construction called and requested a partial certificate of occupancy so that two bedrooms could be moved into the newly finished space and the old bedrooms would become part of a work area for the next phase of the project. It's not uncommon to issue a partial certificate of occupancy when a family is trying to continue living in the house during the renovation. The work conforms to the approved plans and all related building, electrical, plumbing, and energy codes. Ben, do you know what, the, what, the, <clears throat> what was the date of the plans, roughly? Uh, this. Uh, this plan date is January 20, 2012 on the full plan set. And then there's partial plan sets that were revised September 24th, 2012. So you're looking at both sets when, when you're making your inspections? Yes. <clears throat> I have a question for that. Good. Um, how do you know that these are approved um, in the file? They were, uh, some of the plans were in the building permit file and the rolled plans are kept in the code office. So there was one set of rolled plans in the code office that said Mallory on them and have the, the map and lot and the address. and. Uh, because these plans are too big to go in a file cabinet. So those, go, those were in the code office, and uh, the, the revision plans were in the code file. And the Mallory's have always been referring to those two sets that you described as January and September 2012? I'm not sure what you mean. There's no other sets that we're talking about? Not that I'm aware of. And is there ever any other indication on plans that these are the approved set of plans or usually since you've taken over as the code enforcement officer that's how you know if there are plans in the file and a permit's been issue, issued your assumption is that those are the plans that were approved that's correct ben you said you were working for two sets of plans one dated january 20th 2012 yes one dated september 24th 2012 yes is that right is there any import or meaning or anything we should infer by virtue of the fact that the second set of plans was dated, revised after the date the building permit was issued? Yeah, Attorney Bannon spoke to that a bit, uh, and, and he would be able to answer the question better than I can because I wasn't here. But my understanding is they realized a portion of the second floor was a foot over the setback line so they did a new set of plans to push the second floor in a foot so it meets the 10-foot setback. 
So uh, <clears throat> the, the plans then and, and your inspections um, um, lead you to believe that the, that the setback is 10, at, at, at 10 feet, or is it at nine feet? The, the, the setback of the existing structure is nine feet, and the setback <coughs> of the second floor is 10 feet in the area in question. Any other questions from the board for Ben for now? Good question, Ben. There was, there was a question as to whether the building permit for which the certificate of occupancy was issued is complete in the file in the code of I, I believe it to be, other than the larger role plans that have been in my office since the day I started working. So, so from your perspective, then, the CO that you issued is consistent with the plans that the town has? Yes. Any other questions for Ben for now? Okay. Attorney Gaithwaite, if you'd like to return. Mr. McDougal, you started in January of 2013. With the town, is that correct? Um, so you have no personal knowledge of what Mr. Smith had in front of him and what he was using for plans back in June of 2012. Fair to say? Yeah, I can't yeah. hold the conversation with you. Okay. Let me, um, I can make the representation to the board that when my client came to the town office, in early October, there were no plans on file with the exception of some folded up plans that were eventually found. Those are sketch plans. They deal with the normal high watermark issues. Those sketch plans have a stamp on them to show when they would have been received by the town office. The file on file with the town contains a red fluorescent three by five card, and that is dated October 24th of 2012. You may be able to see it in the file that I just looked at two weeks ago in the town office. That October 24th, 2012 three by five card refers to the rolled up plans. There is, at least the plans that were provided to us, contain no date stamp with respect to when they were received by the town. And again, my client made multiple trips here to try to get the plans. We finally filed a Freedom of Information Act request to get the plans. And the plans that are here and dated January 2012 were not provided in response to those requests. I think if you look through that folder, you'll find that fluorescent uh, red uh, card that says the plans are in the office and they're dated October 24th, 2012, which was after we had uh, complained that we did not know what was permitted, we did not know what had been applied for, and we wanted to get a copy of the plans. So that is the first problem that we have as we're sitting here tonight. Their file now has plans in it, but whether or not those were plans that Mr. Smith had relied on, uh, frankly, is not supported by the record, nor by Mr. Smith's uh, testimony at his deposition. He has no file. We asked for copies of Mr. Smith's daily records and daily activities, which the um, town keeps as part of their computer system. Uh, there was no meeting with respect to the architects that was identified in any of those computer records. There was a meeting with Mr. Mallory, with Dr. Mallory, and with a gentleman named Mr. Coombs involving the sketch plan for the normal high watermark 
in uh, May of 2012, but in terms of any type of review of plans, any sort of reference to plans, there is none. What you do have on file and is clearly dated is the application. The application says there will be no change in the existing footprint. Are you supposed to ignore an application that says there is not going to be a change in the existing footprint when we've heard that there is a change in the existing footprint? So I think there's a threshold question about what was permitted, and that's not Mr. McDougall's uh, fault because he wasn't here. He's tried to put pieces together after Mr. Smith left. But Mr. Smith really could not explain to us what he had done or how he had done it. At his deposition, I'll represent to you, I said, I don't see any notes. I don't see any plans. I don't see anything to support what you claim to have been your decision. And he said, well, I must have done it because I wouldn't have issued the permit otherwise. But in terms of finding the documentary proof to show some sort of thought process to say that this project, which was a non-conforming structure on a non-conforming lot within nine feet of the property line, within the normal 75 feet of the normal high water mark, that had already had expansions to it, um, to suggest that this is a legal structure, uh, it, there's just nothing there. And with respect to the certificate of occupancy, um, the photograph that I showed you, and if I could just approach the board and just explain better what I did not artfully explain before. simply have guesswork about what Mr. Smith actually approved. And you can look at the plans, but the plans that were shown to me when I came to the town office did not have a date stamp on them from June of 2012. And the plans that do have a stamp on them as being received are this one or two pages of sketch plans prepared by William Coombs. So in terms of the problems with what was permitted, 
I again suggest that the only thing that's clear in the file is that there's a permit application um, that says there's not going to be any change in the existing footprint. That's a very clear, a very unambiguous statement. And I think there's no question but that there has been a vestibule built um, outside the footprint. There has been a stair tower built outside the footprint. And we have not been given the opportunity to inspect the property. We have a request pending with Judge Cole to be able to inspect the property that has been resisted by the Mallory's. But um, we know that there was a very large concrete truck that came to the property. And we believe, um, but we have not been able to get onto that side of the house to verify it, we believe that there has been uh, additional foundation work done to the seaward section of the house on the uh, part of the house that you can't see from my client's property. So we believe that there have been a number of ex ex extensions of the footprint um, in violation of what has been represented to the town as part of the application process. Council has referenced law court cases. Um, I would refer you to the Brackett decision versus the town of Rangeley where the law court said you have to look at the application to see what was permitted. Right now, what we have is a card that said you are permitted to do the work, and it references a permit application that, again, is not the permit application that we've all been talking about. It's a different permit application, potentially with different plans. We don't know. But the reality is, as we sit here today, there is no documentary basis for concluding that the work that was done on this property complies with the plans. First, because we don't know um, which plans were approved. Second, because it violates what the application said. And third, um, there's nowhere in any of the plans that suggests that you would interfere more into the nine-foot setback than you already are. And I don't believe, and I'll defer to Mr. McDougall's expertise, but I don't believe that there's any statement or diagram in those plans um, to depict this uh, intrusion into the setback. So those are uh, major issues that we have um, in terms of procedurally, if I could just respond to Attorney Bannon's statements. Right now, we have asked Judge Cole for permission to come back to you so that you can reach the merits of my client's appeal. Judge Cole has not made a decision on that, in part because with the agreement of the parties, because of Mr. Smith's um, somewhat extraordinary departure from the town and the omissions in the record, the parties have agreed that we need to try to piece together some of this information. So we are taking depositions and we're exchanging documents. So the fact that we, um, there's a suggestion that we keep on appealing, we have not kept on appealing. We appealed once. We're trying to get facts together so that we can come back to you with a full set of information when Judge Cole allows us to do that. The reason that I um, recommended that we file an appeal of the certificate of occupancy is that I did not want to be in the situation where procedurally later on somebody would suggest, oh, you should have appealed that certificate of occupancy. So that is why we are here. We're not trying to all my clients have ever wanted and all they wanted back in the fall of 2012 was to have you folks look at all the evidence and call it the way you see it and make an up or down vote on the merits of their arguments. And instead of that, the procedural argument was made that they would not allow us to present the merits of the case to you and they've made us appeal to the court. If they had not objected, we could have presented the merits of the appeal 
at that time and we could have avoided going to the court but that was a decision that the mallory's made to make us have to appeal and to block our ability to present our substantive appeal back in the fall of 2012. With respect to the DEP application, the Mallory's never applied for a DEP application. We contacted the DEP and said, is there an application on file? Has their permit been issued? And the DEP ultimately issued a permit by rule, but I will represent to the board that they made that decision based on substantive information that was not provided to us and without any notice to us that the architects had provided information to the DEP. Um, the DEP made a decision and we got notice of it on Christmas Eve and were not given an opportunity to respond to it. And, I, and you know what's accurate, John? The reality is that all my f clients have ever wanted is for this board to be able to fairly and objectively look at all the evidence and call it the way they see it. That's all we have ever asked for. We're here tonight because as part of this process, if I were not to have filed an appeal, I would have expected another procedural argument that uh, would have been made when we finally get back in front of the board uh, after Judge Cole hopefully grants our Rule ADB appeal to come back and see you again. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Again, this is a serious matter. This is a non-conforming house on a non-conforming lot that we believe has been way overbuilt. It interferes with my client's property, my client's ability to use their property, and uh, we appreciate very much your time and your patience. I understand um, that you're volunteers, so I will sit down and not take any more of your time unless you have some questions that you would like me to answer. And does anybody have any questions for Attorney Gateway at this time? I've got a question. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so. Okay. Uh, sorry if, if uh, this question. If this isn't the way that, that uh, the case is kept being carried out in the courts, but what, you said you just deposed Mr. Smith. Was was he ever asked what set of plans he uh, he based the building permit rule off? Right, Mr. Smith. We showed him plans. Um, he said, "I guess those are the plans." My memory is that I asked him questions about the stamps on the plans, either on the record or off the record, and he's the person who told me, well, they should be stamped. I don't know why they're not stamped. So th this is the January 20th and September 24th plans? Right. That Ben has ben right. assumed are the right. plans? Right. And so we asked him, question, I asked him, where are the calculations, for example, to show um, how much impervious surface there is on this lot? Don't have them. Where are the calculations that show what the 30% volume calculations are? Don't have them. Where are the calculations about the 30% square footage? Don't have them. Um, why is it that we have a normal high water mark that is based on a 1929 plan that talks about mean high water and not the Cape Elizabeth zoning ordinance? And um, he basically said that if I'm, and I have a copy of his transcript here, I can get the exact quote, but basically he said he, that he thought it would be more restrictive to apply um, the, a different high water mark to the Mallory's and he didn't think that was fair. Um, and I asked him if anybody had trained him that under the zoning ordinance, particularly with a non-conforming structure, you are supposed to view the ordinance in a matter that is more restrictive instead of less restrictive and my memory is that he told me he had not been trained. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? For Attorney Gateway? Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Attorney Bennett? Perhaps we could take a moment and uh, let our heads stop spinning and return to the issue that is before the board. The issue before the board is, 
have the Freedmen shown that the Mallory's built anything in their addition that was contrary to the plans that were approved for this project. They object that there is not absolutely perfect certainty that the plans that are where you'd expect to find the plans are the plans, or that the red note in the file may have some sinister meaning or not, I was trying to recall what Occam's razor is. Perhaps those of you who are smarter than me can remember that, but I think that a popular translation of it is that if you hear hoofbeats, don't look for zebras. Uh, the most likely, the, the explanation that takes the fewest number of steps is likely, is most likely to be the correct one. The only way that you can find that the Mallory's built their, their addition contrary to the plans is if you reject the most logical inference from all of the facts that have been presented to you. And I respectfully submit that this is not something the board should or even wants to do. Thank you. Any questions for Attorney Bennett before you go? Attorney Bennett, I have a couple of questions for you. I'm sorry. Unless. No? Go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll just, I took down some notes and perhaps you can add some clarity to these. Is that, um, are the Mallory's able to confirm the date of the plan that they submitted to the code enforcement officer? I'm, I, I'm sorry, I'm a little hard of hearing and I just turned up my hearing aid to try, please ask again. Can the Mallory's confirm the date of the plans that were submitted either with their planning application or subsequently? Can the Mallory's? Yes. Would you like them to? I, I can. Okay. There's no question you, about what they are. Uh, what dates are they? Pardon me? What are the dates and the plans that were submitted? Um, they are January something for the first set, and they're September, I think, 24, 2012 for the second set. There are only two sets of plans. There's one date on one, and there's another date on the other, and that's the only dates that are on any of the plans. Thank you. Um, when the Mallory submitted their building application, they did not seek a variance for any of the setbacks. Is that correct? That is correct, because they didn't need one. Thank you. Any other questions for Attorney Bannon? Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, is there anybody here, any, uh, anybody in the public who would like to comment on this before we uh, close the discussion? Hearing nobody, um, I guess I'd like to open it up for discussion for the board. Anybody would like to start? Sure. Okay. The, the, the extension uh, that was shown in the photograph by Attorney Dickwood is, is, in your opinion, is that is that the is that shown? <coughs> Yes, it's shown on the plan right here in front of me, okay. and it, it was built per the plan. Okay. Thanks. And we recognize, of course, that it may or may not be water under the dam, but it's, it's at the nine foot setback, not 10 feet. It's in violation of the setback. That's, that, that's. Let me ask well, a question. That's the section of the house that was existing at the nine foot setback. Existing nonconformity. Existing nonconformity. They stepped the second floor in and, and built that 45 degree angle piece in order to, so the house doesn't fill with water. for Ben, any general thoughts? I had a couple of questions for you, Ben. 
Um, there's a provision, I can't find it now, but there's an obligation when there's a issuing of a occupancy permit. What steps do you look, what steps do you do to go through that process to when you actually execute the um, occupancy permit? From the building inspection perspective? Well, the way I see the ordinance is that um, essentially it's on your remit. And so that you look at the file and go through the, uh, a checklist, if you will, um, and that if there's an issue that does come up, you, you have a process by which you investigate and see if there's an issue. Yes. And that was done in this case? Oh, yeah, sorry. I, if there was an issue that had come up, you would investigate it. Yeah. It I, was not an issue, so that hence you issued the partial occupancy permit. That's correct. The, the building construction met all the required building codes, and it appeared to meet all the plans and specifications that I was privy to. So I issued their certificate of occupancy. So this is to the board as a whole. How do we reconcile the two allegations that it's in the setback versus it's not in the setback? If it's in the setback, I think, I think Ben just answered that question. If, if it's in the setback, it's an ex, it was an existing, from what I'm hearing, it was at nine feet um, under the original plans. I mean, I mean, I guess the question is, prior to the renovation, was the existing footprint at nine feet, right? I mean, so it was, in, it, was it an existing non-conforming <coughs> at the time they started the renovation? And so, so, is that what you're driving at? Yes, and so the, the setback of 10 feet, is that right? So the second story is in further recess back. So it's not an enlargement of the uh, non-conformity. Is that correct? If, if, the, if prior to the renovation, the, the footprint, the, you know, that whatever that corner is, I don't have the plans in front of me. Which, yeah. You know, at, at nine feet, yeah. Okay. I have no more questions. To make a clarifying point, sure. uh, what the argument of Attorney Gaithway is the slight overhang that's shown here. And the second floor was stepped in, and then the, there's a very small 45 in order to keep the rain out, and that overhangs the existing wall slightly by a few inches. Uh, that is something that's been allowed in Cape Elizabeth forever, as far as I know, slight, slight roof overhangs in order to shed water, in order to have a healthy structure. So, they, so that, is, that is the point, that that additional, that small additional triangle of a few inches in order to shed the rain. Um, I don't believe that's a setback violation. Uh, the, uh, in Cape Elizabeth, the setbacks have always been measured, to the best of my knowledge, to the edge of the siding, and uh, in a small overhang has been allowed. And, and again, these are the plans that were in the office and that you based your granting of the occupants of occupancy permit on. Right. That's you know I, I didn't I didn't review this for zoning compliance. The, these are the set of approved plans, so I don't. Right. You know, I don't, I don't, I really don't think we can discuss whether or not that meets the, z the zoning setback or not. That this is the set of plans we have in front of us. This is what I based my occupancy permit on. Sorry, I, you made a statement that I just want to be clear on. If there is a material departure from the zoning ordinance on those plans, that would be something that you would have to look at. Is that correct? Uh, no. I mean, these are plans that have been approved. To, ben, to Ben's understanding, they have been approved. And they... And, For building. And they should be consistent with the zoning ordinance. Right. But, I mean, th these are... 
when, when he's granting, when he's issuing the, the occupancy permit, he's looking at the plans that had been approved by the town. Yes. And, I mean, it's not at that point where he goes and, and reconfirms that everything in the plans that were approved should have been approved the first time. Yeah, there is a presumption that the process worked out. Right. And that the previous code enforcement officer looked at the zoning ordinance, approved it accordingly, and it gets passed on. Correct. So my query is that if it's a material breach or a material departure, and it's something that's so obvious, then the query is whether the original approval will subject that should not have been approved. So that's why I raised that query. Is that I don't think it's a blanket. We just accept a previous uh, approved application. I think there's some independent thought that has to go into it as well. We're not just... Well, it, you're stating, I mean, is, is that a question for Ben? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that point. That it, it, um, you receive the file if there's a material breach. Or if there's my, a, I, I guess when you're looking at the plans that, are, that have been approved and for the granting of of an occupancy permit, do you at least consider whether or not these plans are generally in conformance with the ordinance? No, I don't. No. I'm not sure. That, I'm not sure that it would be proper to. I mean, if you if you approve someone's proposed plans and say, yes, go build this. I'm not sure. After the fact, you can say, oh, never mind. Uh, we, we've changed our interpretation, and, or we're looking at a different view. In, in fact, you can't build that. I mean, no, my point is that I think there should be due deference to the previous person. Um, I, I'm not advocating that we should reinvent the wheel, but I am suggesting that there's probably a, a good reason that we should reread the paperwork to make sure it's a consistent with our understanding of the, the, uh, the zoning ordinance. Um, whether this issue is um, material, I'm, I don't believe I'm that troubled by it. I'm, I'm troubled that I just want to understand the process by which a previous application was approved, time has moved on, more people, you know, there's a change in position. Um, and I want to avoid an issue that there's some uncertainty and ambiguity, and I want to just make sure that we're um, reflecting properly as to the process by which we actually do our jobs, including the code enforcement officer. So that when we're looking at a, at a file, we're not just rubber stamping the file. That's the point. To what extent you, know, you go through it and actually re redo the, the effort, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to su suggest reinvent the wheel again. But uh, uh, this discussion seems somewhat theoretical. At least let, let me, because I had a question on here all day that I've been waiting to ask, and again, as, as the second non-lawyer on the board, as we all painfully know, um, <laughs> the, 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 the question I have is, and this is what's before the ZBA, mm -hmm. and, and I think Attorney Gateway articulated it earlier, <laughs> it, are, are, we, are we focused on whether just the compliance of what was approved. Are we just looking at what was approved, what, what the CO that was issued is consistent with the plans, okay? Or, or, or are we also looking to see whether um, this is in compliance with the zoning ordinances? I mean, my, my view right now is that it's the former. It's whether or not this, the occupancy permit that was issued was in conformance with the permit that was issued the building permit that was issued. Now, I understand there's a question or there have been arguments raised that the permit, it's unclear what, what the permit allowed. But I think, um, I mean, the issue before the board is did the, occupancy did the occupancy permit conform with the building permit? Um, I mean, you know, my, my inclination at this point is, you know, having heard what Ben discussed was his process and what he found in the, in the town office is that um, based on the plans that were in the town office and based on his inspection of the property and of the work, that it is. Now, that, that's not 
making a general statement as to whether or not the initial permit should have been issued because that has not yet been before the board. It wasn't before the board in 2012 because the board found that the appeal was untimely and that is now what is being appealed to the Superior Court and there's still fact finding going on at that level which if that and ends up being remanded there will be additional facts that will be before the board that would presumably assist the board in ruling on whether or not the permit should have initially been issued but at this point my inclination is we're looking at the permit that was issued the building permit that was issued and was the work done in compliance with that permit and hearing uh, Ben's explanation for how he um, you know, went into the office and found the plans that he believed is what the permit was issued on, that um, the occupancy permit was properly issued based on that. Okay, and, and, and Ben, I, I, I know I asked earlier whether the, 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 uh, the, CO, the CO issued um, was consistent with the plans, was it consistent with the permit as well? Well, the, the permit says per plans. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's easy. <laughs> I mean, I would also agree that, that, I mean, at the end of the day, I think what is before us is, is whether the CO that was issued um, is consistent with the plans on the permit and um, it, it seems, you know, based upon the materials and just listening to, um, you know, people's arguments tonight that, that and, and Ben's process, that is, that, that's, that seems that's the case as far as I'm concerned. I, I agree and it may strike some of us as unfair, but I think state law actually constrains us to that issue where it appears <coughs> that the construction conform with the plans and therefore the application uh, met all the building codes I think we have no choice but to but to proceed and, and basically confirm the issuance of the occupancy plan. Yeah I agree with that summary as well. Anybody like to? I would like to make a motion. Do I just get to say so moved? No, <laughs> you have to make a motion, Mike. I mean, it, it, you're, I, I you're an attorney. <laughs> I, w I guess I would simply move to affirm the issuance of the occupancy permit as issued by uh, the town code enforcement officer. And I would welcome any friendly amendments to that motion if they're necessary. Um, well, I guess since it's, it's an appeal of right. the issuance, should the motion be to deny the appeal? <coughs> so motion to deny I'll make a motion to deny the administrative appeal on the temporary certificate of occupancy um, issued uh, November 15, 2013, permit number 109994. Get up, did I get all the particulars right? Can you say that again? Oh. To, deny, to, deny, <laughs> to deny the administrative appeal but, of the temporary certificate of occupancy, occupancy issued on November 15, 2013, permit number 109994. Okay, so there's now a motion to deny the administrative appeal of the temporary certificate of occupancy issued on November 15th, uh, 2013, permit number 109994. Do you have a second? Second. All in favor? All right, so that motion passes five nothing to deny the administrative appeal. Um,
Doesn't the plan speak for itself? Sure. Data of what plan? Let me put it a different. Should we have an additional finding of facts that simply cites the plans that 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 the uh, CEO is relying upon for purposes of issuing the partial CEO? Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, all right, I'm going to now read the findings of fact and then we'll add to them as necessary. Um, number one, this is an administrative appeal of the code enforcement officer's decision to issue a temporary certificate of occupancy for a building project at 40 Surf Road, map U5, lot 42. Two, the appellants are Harold and Mary Friedman, who reside at 36 Surf Road, which abuts the subject property. Three. On June 6, 2012, a building permit application for 40 Surf Road was received to add an addition on the second floor above a pre-existing roof and for a new mudroom. Four, the application was assigned permit number 120434. Five, a permit was granted on June 8, 2012 with the permit number 120434 assigned with a building permit pl placard having the number 109994. Six, on November 5th, 2012, an administrative appeal was filed on behalf of Harold and Mary Friedman, questioning the authority of the code enforcement officer to issue the June 8th, 2012 permit. Seven, on November 27th, 2012, the Zoning Board of Appeals denied the administrative appeal as a result of it being untimely. The Friedmans have appealed this decision to, superior, to the Superior Court and the matter is still pending a final decision. Eight, on November 15th, 2013, the code enforcement officer issued a partial temporary certificate of occupancy so that the homeowner can trans transition the use of two bedrooms into the newly constructed space in order to continue the construction project into previously occupied space. And let's add the new finding of fact after that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to give it a shot. Go ahead. Here, what, three. Um, Good luck. The CEO relied on the plans dated January 20th, 2012, as revised on, nine, nine. on, on September 24th, 2012, for purposes of issuing the certificate of partial occupancy. Can I make a comment? Sure. There, there are the complete plan set is the January plan set. So I didn't fully rely on the September plan set for the certificate of occupancy, I relied on both plan sets technically. So you want an and? The, the September plan set are a few sheets of the total package that were amended to uh, rectify the encroachment. So, I mean, wasn't, wasn't it that, I mean, I think, we, I, think I said, the plans dated January 20, 2012, as revised by the September 24, 2012. Okay. You want amended? You want added? No, revised, is, is, amended? As long as that says I used both plan sets. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. That's what I heard. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. So we'll keep that. Um, on December 13, 2013, Harold and Mary Friedman submitted an application for administrative appeal to appeal the code enforcement officer's decision to issue a partial temporary certificate of occupancy. Um, all in favor of the findings of fact? All right. 
five nothing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is to hear the request of Austin Shad of 191 Fowler Road, map U44-28, to appeal the code enforcement officer's denial of a building permit to construct an agricultural building that is intended to be used as part of the applicant's existing produce business, which is located at a different site. Um, and before we hear um, from the uh, applicant, um, Ben, if you could just give us uh, some general background. Sure. Uh, I'd like to start by saying I, I truly want Austin and Mary Ellen Chad's produce business to, to thrive in Cape Elizabeth. I want you guys to be successful farmers here. I, that, I truly mean that. Uh, the Chads want to grow vegetables on their property uh, to supply their produce business. I told them in November that the use is allowed, but it requires site plan approval from the planning board. They disagree with this interpretation. In the rebuttal to my building permit denial, the Chads make some well-founded points regarding the application. It would be nice if the ordinance was clearer on this subject. Ultimately, this decision has far-reaching implications for Cape Elizabeth, and I feel the town is better served to have the zoning board make the decision. This issue comes down to the definition of non-residential use and how the ordinance intends it to be applied. The ordinance can be read two different ways. The Chads contend that their use is resource related and therefore does not require site plan review. In my opinion, the ordinance intends new uses that are not residential to obtain site plan approval. In support of my decision, here are three facts. Uh, in section 1981, uh, buffering of non-residential uses. It states that buffers are required on the side and rear yards of non-residential uses except agriculture. So the ordinance is stating a non-residential requirement and then specifically exempting agriculture, which leads me to believe the ordinance looks at agriculture as a non-residential use. Uh, second point. In the site plan review section, 1992B, uh, certain types of agricultural buildings are exempt from site plan review. Why would these exemptions exist if site plan review doesn't apply to agriculture? Uh, if my interpretation of this is wrong, it renders that whole section of the ordinance essentially meaningless uh, because agricultural buildings wouldn't need any exemptions to site plan review. Uh, it would mean that someone could conceptually build a three or 4,000 square foot agricultural building uh, with a simple building permit. And maybe this is the case. That to me does not seem to be the intent of the ordinance. Uh, I believe the ordinance intends those agricultural exemptions to apply to existing farms and still expects, expects new non-residential farming operations to obtain a site plan approval. Lastly, in our definition section, it states that all words not defined herein shall carry their customary and usual meanings. Non-residential is not defined in the zoning ordinance, so I would contend that we should use the customary and usual meaning of the word 
which to me is anything that is not residential. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. Um, okay, um, Chad. <clears throat> so, um, good evening. My name is Austin Chad, and today with me are John Green and Jay Cox from the Cape Farm Alliance. Um, a summary of my position is as follows: First, the current use of the lot located at 191 Fowler Road is that of a single-family dwelling, which is a permitted residential use under Section 19-6-1B2A on page 56. An allowable accessory use to a residential use is that of an accessory building listed under section 19.6.1.B.4.A on page 56. The definition of an accessory building found on page 2 includes an agricultural building. Further, the construction of a single family dwelling or accessory building does not require site plan review as stated in section 19.9.2.B.1 on page 224. More specifically, a greenhouse under 2,000 square feet does not require site plan review under section 19-92B3C. Secondly, the proposed use of the accessory building is to perform agriculture, which includes growing, harvesting, and selling of crops as the definition states on page two. A permitted resource related use found in section 19-6-1B1B on page 56 and therefore not listed as a non-residential use. Additionally, the zoning ordinance specifically states that non-residential uses of property require site plan review in section 19-9-2A2 on page 224. The Zoning Board of Appeals has ruled that resource-related uses of property do not require site plan review as determined in their minutes from July 26, 2011, page page two, line one through two. And finally, within the denial letter for the building permit number 140031, code enforcement officer classifies the proposed use as a non-residential agricultural use. Such classification does not exist within the zoning ordinance. The only agricultural use can be found under resource related use. Miscategorizing the proposed use of the property and requiring site plan review as a non-residential use is incorrect as use is a resource related use which does not require site plan review according to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chad. Um, yes, yes, we, we have that. I, I believe um, we have the memorandum that was submitted in support of uh, the building permit, which is, thank you for submitting that. It's actually very helpful and detailed. Um, I guess before we have uh, questions for um, Mr. Chad, uh, well, actually, why don't we have questions for him first before we do public comment? Um, any questions from the board for uh, Mr. Chad? I'm sorry, Chair. W were we planning to come back to Mr. Chad after public comment? No, I was actually, let's ask questions for him now, and then we okay. can come back if we have more questions for him. But okay. while he's, Mr. Chad, if you want to return to the podium. Um, um, and because John Green helped to write a lot of the ordinance um, as in respects to agriculture in Cape Elizabeth, I'm using him as support because uh, he knows it inside out. Great, so. great. And, um, let's, let's first ask questions, if, if the board has questions directly for you. Sure. And then when we get to the public comment section, then um, we can hear from um, him and any, anybody. Okay. Uh, Matt? I was going to let... You want me to start? Sure. Good evening. Um, is the structure that you plan to build, is that going to be permanent and such that 12 months out of the year will be there? So a greenhouse is a non-permanent structure. It doesn't have a foundation. Um, is that what you're getting Sorry. at? When you, thank you for clarifying. Mm -hmm. When you wish to put up the greenhouse, sure. how many months out of the year will it be physically standing? Oh, sure. It's, it's, I operate it year round. So. I grow in the winter, in the fall, in the spring, in the summer. And part of the application, you were mentioning that you were going to sell crops 
not at the facility, not from your property? But Correct. So how are we going to get the crops from the greenhouse to where you would sell them? So uh, at my farm, we use wheelbarrows, we use... Thank you for clarifying again. Sure. Um, once you have a, a bushel of carrots, okay. do you put them in a car or a truck or some sort of vehicle, and then what, what happens? We use a small electric golf cart, um, and you know we have a washing station that's maybe 20 feet from where greenhouse is, so it's a very short distance. Thank you for clarifying, Ken. What I mean is that when you actually put them in, do you actually drive on the road, and where do you go once you leave your property with the produce? If I were to collect produce from the greenhouses, yes. my farm is about 40 seconds down the road, um, and I have walk-in coolers there. I also have a farm stand at the farm, so okay. that is where the produce would You don't anticipate suppliers, vendors coming to your property, is that correct? Absolutely not. That is correct. Uh, I may have some follow-up, but why don't we pass along to you guys. Anybody else? Mr. Chad, you're, you live at 191, Fowler, is that right? Correct. Okay, and I'm just trying to get the, the picture of it. Where, where, is the, um, where is the farm? Green Spark Farm is located on 316 Fowler Road. This will be our sixth year in that location. Fifth year, I'm sorry. that question okay. sure. do, do you own and live in the residence that's on the property we bought the house in december of tw uh, 20th of 2013 so yes Questions for now for Mr. Chad. And uh, I will have a. I'll state the obvious, Mr. Chad. What was the reason why you did not seek a, a site plan review? Is it you just your position that it didn't apply? That is correct. And do you have a, a thinking as to why you? Um, this is not a home business, a home occupation. It's agriculture. It doesn't that it's a different um, agriculture is a separate category from a home business or a enterprise. I don't believe it can be categorized as a home business. I have no more questions. Okay, unless there are any other questions for Mr. Chad, um, I guess we'll open it up for public comment at this point. We might come back to you, Mr. Chad, but um, you wanted to. Good evening, my name is Jim Rowe, and I live at 127 Oakhurst Road. Um, in retrospect, I'm gonna ramble a little bit, but I'll be done in two minutes, I promise. Uh, in retrospect, the contribution of which I am most proud uh, during my tenure on the town council here in Cape Elizabeth was sponsoring the Cape Farm Alliance into existence. One of the main factors, if not the driving factor, in the formation of the Cape Farm Alliance in 2006-2007 was the scheduled review and updating of the town's comprehensive plan, which would take place over the following three years. It was important that the farming community be represented at the discussion table, and more important, that they be on the same page and they, that they be advocating for the same issues. Since its inception, the Alliance has helped to bring farms in our town together. It's helped to educate the community with regard to the importance of our local farms. And for our purposes tonight, 
It has helped town leaders to recognize and work with our farmers as a group in order to preserve and enhance agriculture within the borders of Cape Elizabeth. In my opinion, our town must take every opportunity it can to preserve and ideally promote our agriculture in this town. Four reasons for that. Farms create jobs. Far number two, farms retain open space, which has been identified quantitatively as an important desire of most of our citizens. Three, our town has since its founding been a uh, community of, of agriculture and fishing, and we must never, ever allow that heritage to die. And number four, this reason dwarfs all the others. We must sustain local sources of fresh, healthy food, food that has not been dosed with preservatives, coloring agents, and chemicals that are increasingly being linked to problems like obesity, chemical imbalances, cancers, and other serious diseases. As you on the Zoning Board of Appeals well know, ordinances are on paper are one thing, but interpretations of those ordinances may vary from person to person. That's your job to sort that out. This item before you tonight is a matter of practicality. I'd urge you to use reason in your interpretation of the applicable ordinances and to rule in favor of the applicants here. Not only is their application on what I believe to be very solid ground in ordinance that was developed cooperatively by the Cape Farm Alliance and the town, but it makes sense. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Rowe. Good evening. My name is John Green, a member of the Cape Farm Alliance and also uh, a member of uh, the committee that helped draft ordinances in relation to agriculture in working with the town as several other members here have. Um, I wanted to just get into a little bit of the uh, ordinance language and sort of clarify some things. The intent um, was to make agriculture uh, viable in town and also uh, uh, not restrict it. So we work with the town to make uh, the zoning less restrictive for agriculture to help promote it all the way down to micro farms on small lots. And in that case, agriculture was allowed all the way through to the RC zone, the smallest uh, lots in town. But I'm going to focus on the RA quickly here. And um, the uh, agriculture is a resource-related use. Um, and then we also have non-residential uses listed as a separate category. If you go further into the uh, RA, there is Section F, Site Plan Review. And agriculture is not listed in that section specifically. So if we turn to site plan review, um, Article 9, and we look, I believe the sticking point would be uh, under applicability under 1992, number 2. Any non-residential expansion or change of use, etc. And I think there's a problematic bit of language in that that refers to non-residential, not agriculture, and uh, the word non-residential should follow through to change of use. They're specifically referring to item three under the RA zone. So that precludes agriculture. And the, uh, if you turn the page under activities not requiring, this implies that agriculture, other than certain sized buildings, farm markets, etc., cetera, um, are allowed. And the reason for that, now we go back all the way to the definitions, and I'll be uh, done in a minute, uh, under accessory buildings or structures, uh, the bottom of that definition, for residential uses, accessory buildings and structures shall include, but not be limited to, garage, gazebo, greenhouse, home workshop, recreational facilities, agriculture or aquaculture buildings. The, this implies that agriculture is compatible with residential areas because it's an accessory use. And agriculture, under its own definition, implies the selling of the products. And this is not going to be the case in this situation, um, but in the case of micro farms selling honey, for example, herbs, etc., let's say in the RC zone, that would be allowed as long as you did not have a full blown farm market, but perhaps a temporary structure. Uh, for a certain time of the year. So we wrote these ordinances to be as liberal as possible uh, with agriculture in town. And I think by reading it carefully, I think all of this supports the CHADS um, 
premise that they can have a uh, hoop house uh, in their backyard. Thank you. Mr. Green, I, I guess I have a question for you. Yes. Did you go back again, and, and uh, I didn't quite catch what you said around uh, 1992 and the non-residential expansion or change in use? Yes, I was pointing out that um, uh, that item uh, is a sticking point in the sense of someone could read that and misinterpret it. As was said earlier, um, the zoning ordinance is not perfect, and every time I read it, um, I place notes in it because there are places such as that where a misinterpretation can occur. And, um, you know, in all due respect to Ben, being new in town, there was a lot of effort that went into this whole process of uh, rewriting the ordinance. And obviously, it's uh, especially for someone of, you know, professional like Ben, it's easy to find things in here that aren't quite right, and hence the need to explain um, things such as that where, where someone could misinterpret that. So it's a, from your perspective, it's a drafting issue? Correct. It, it is a, uh, that non-residential should have been also put before change of use, because that's specifically referring to uh, item three in the RA zone, those specific non-residential uh, items, and um, not agriculture as a resource related use. Thank you. William Bamford, 112 Spurwick Avenue. What's your, what's your last name again, sir? Bamford, B-A-M-F-O-R-D. Good evening. Uh, my wife Lois and I own Maxwell's Farm. Um, my wife Lois was unable to be here tonight. She is a sixth generation of the Maxwell family to be farming in Cape Elizabeth. When South Portland and Cape Elizabeth separated in 1895, several generations of the Maxwell and Jordan families had already been cultivating what is now Cape farmland. In the early 20th century, Cape farms were a major source of produce for Portland. Also a large portion of our product went to the Boston market during this time. In the 1930s, there were 40 to 50 tar farms in town. In the 40s, there were about 35, and by 1950, it was down to 20. Suburbia was beginning to encroach on Cape Elizabeth. It was also during the 50s that iceberg lettuce became a major crop of Cape farmers. In the 1960s, there were only about 10 farms in town, and we hit an all-time low in the 70s at six farms. Taxes the increased costs of inputs and machinery, and national agribusinesses, as well as the pressure of development, were beginning to take their toll. It was during this time that the residents had a growing realization that valuable farmland was disappearing. The importance of saving farmland and the farmers who care for it became increasingly important to Cape residents. In the latest comprehensive plan update, saving farmland became the highest priority in the town. People worked together to address some of the challenges that modern farms and farmers face. As a result, today there are 16 farms in town, both conventional and organic. The majority grow strawberries and vegetables, but there are also growers of herbs, blueberries, Christmas trees, as well as meat, which includes beef, pigs, and lamb. Outlets include seven on-site markets or stands, as well as CSAs, out-of-town uh, farm markets and wholesale markets. For 150 to 200 years, residential homes and Cape farmers have lived side by side. As farmers, we realize that our neighbors, many of whom are our customers, enjoy different lifestyles and schedules than we do. We do our best to respect that and feel that conversely our neighbors respect our choice of business and lifestyle. Agriculture never has been, nor was it intended to be separated from our residences. It's an important part of the fabric of our community that when woven together makes Cape Elizabeth one of the most desired towns in our state. Thank you. Question? Thank you, Mr. Bamford. Sorry, Chair, I have a question of the witness. Oh, sorry. Mr. Bamford. Yes. Uh, we know each other. We met at the yes. farm allowance, um, I think, the dinner a couple of weeks ago. Hopefully, there's no issue here. But um, how long have you been living in this town? Personally, myself, uh, I'm the new guy in town. I've only been here about 30 years. 
And so was 191 Fowler Road part of a farm at one time? Uh, I could not answer that uh, personally. Okay. I have no. Uh, sorry, sorry. When, when you come up, please uh, clearly make that statement for us. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Um, my name is Kelly Gordon, and I live at 110 Two Lights Road. And I just wanted to kind of break it down very simply um, from what I've been hearing as a homeowner on 191 Fowler Road. As a homeowner on 191 Fowler Road, it seems to me in very simple that they've met all the criteria to build a simple greenhouse hoop house under 2,000 square feet. And they've met all the criteria. They've met the ordinance that it is. They're following all the guidelines. And I think it should pass. I think every resident has the right to do this. It's the Chads have another business, but they've already said that traffic, it won't be an increase of traffic. They're not selling out of that. So if I wanted to put a hoop house on my property, I wouldn't be here. It, it would be a non-issue. And I think every citizen has a right to do that as the guidelines stand. So that's it. Thank you. Other public comment? Hi there. I'm Penny Jordan. I'm one of the owners of Jordan's Farm here in Cape Elizabeth at 21 Wells Road. Um, I stand here today as a fourth generation farmer and I stand in this room knowing that my father sat in this room many times thinking about how we merge and how we blend our community so that we could embrace the evolution that was happening at the same time we could sustain and ensure the viability of our farms. In 2008, the Cape Farm Alliance presented a report to the Town Council on the current state and the future state of farming in Cape Elizabeth. The next step after that was to work diligently with the Planning Board on ordinances to ensure Cape Elizabeth's farming future. These are very, very key words as the Cape Farm Alliance works to ensure that we will have viable and successful farms in our town. The definition of agriculture was crafted in a way that would help ensure Cape's farming future. And as the key elements of this definition um, speak, the purpose of agriculture is to ensure the diversity of agriculture. It's the primary purpose is raising and selling crops. Agriculture and farming in Cape Elizabeth has been a commercial operation for generations. We wanted to continue to build on this. In our work, we recognized housing developments grew out of the fields of the once working farms and that, the fam and that had been owned by families for generations. We sought to continue the vision of our parents and ensure that farming would be able to coexist and ideally flourish in a town that people across this state are in awe that Cape Elizabeth of all communities has experienced growth in agriculture over the last five years. When I think about the town as a child, and that was a really long time ago, um, and what was going on and achieving coexistence, um, I believe that the community leaders were masterful, creating a vision that recognized the value of farms through the food they produce, the vistas they maintain, and the job experiences they create for the young people in the community, while embracing at the same time the transformation of the town we were experiencing. Agriculture is a vital part of our community. It is the work of several families in this town, and I mean work as in career and vocation. Working together, we can minimize the barriers and ensure that farming continues to grow and flourish for generations to come. The dynamic tension between houses and fields has been happening for over 50 years. We're now at a point where young people are choosing farming as a career. 
Cape Elizabeth needs to continue the vision of past generations and continue to embrace working farms as a key part of what makes Cape Elizabeth unique and vibrant community. And I thank you very much for listening this evening and for being part of the zoning board. Thank you, Ms. Jordan. Any, were, there, were there any questions? No. Okay. Good evening. My name is Nick Tamaro, and I own Down Home Farm up to Harvest Lane, as well as Tamaro Landscaping. <coughs> um, I was in the Chad same position in 2009. I uh, developed a paper street and I had to go through site plan review. That was just to get onto the property to be able to build a house in a barn. I learned very quickly that it was an extremely expensive endeavor. I was very young, you know, it, was, uh, it cost me $9,000 to go through site plan review. And I don't take, I'm in the process of going through site plan review now again for my current business. And it proves to be unaffordable for a farmer starting out. 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 is the difference between a walk behind rototiller or a ride on tractor with a rototiller. Um, my biggest thing is, is that I think farming is extremely important and there's not many young people getting into it. And if it becomes so difficult to even get the town to say it's okay to do it, as you know, sure thing as putting a hoop house on a property where you live, it, it could be, uh, I don't think young people are going to continue to do it. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Pat Salvi Bothell, 90 Ocean House Road. I'm also Fox Run Farm and Bothell's Mechanical Repair. And I've got in front of me here notes from the um, minutes of the July 26, 2011 Zoning Board meeting that I was at, I got to sit in the chair that the chair, Chads are sitting in now, and ended up having to come here with a lawyer because we didn't know the right words. Um, we were trying to grow blueberries. Excuse me, I'm menopausal. <laughs> we were trying to grow blueberries on land that my husband's family had owned for 125 years. And in the process of trying to get that done, found out that we had buildable land that we could put 14 condominiums on. And for a minute, I had dollar signs dancing in my head in Cape Elizabeth, 14 properties. I mean, this is worth so much. We didn't want to do that. Um, my husband has never lived more than 200 feet from where he lives today. His mom is still on the property. We ended up spending $35,000 dollars to grow blueberries. I think I might have had an easier shot at a nuclear power plant. We now have 300 high bush blueberries. But this is a farming community. Why I needed to go that far and hire the number of professionals. It wasn't just a lawyer. There were different kinds of surveyors and wetlands planners and mappers and it's it's really not that complicated. And what these kids want to do is something that this whole town should be cheering. We all ought to be out there helping them put it up, <clears throat> not questioning motives or of, are you going to try and make money out of this? I don't think that that really comes into question at all. From my notes, I have a couple of, of things. And again, let me just tell you, this is July 26, 2011, so you can look them up if you want. On page 2, line 9, agriculture is neither residential nor non-residential. Site plan review is not required for resource-related uses. Um, on that same paper, line 22, section 19-6-1 lists what is permitted in residential A district. Agriculture is listed in subparagraph B. In section 19-9-2, page 219, site plan review is not required for agricultural use. Um, the chairman at that time, um, I think his name is Giliano. Gil Gilino, I'm not sure. Um, he replied he was relying on section 19-6-1 
B, permitted uses, which states the following are accepted uses, agriculture and under 4-H, agriculture-related use. You've already been here. This whole town has already been here. Let's just do the right thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions? No? All right. I'm Stephen Bothell at 90 Ocean House Road. Some of this is going to be a little bit of a repeat because we didn't share notes. Um, I did a little research on this. Um, it says, um, in the state of Maine, farmers 34 years old and younger, um, it has grown by 40% a period of time between 2000 and 2012. Um, as far as the whole United States goes, um, it's only grown 1.5%. Um, in the state of Maine, um, there's been an 8% increase in the land use for farming um, in the, between 2000 and 2000, 2007 and 2012. Um, when I looked it up, I came across 20 farms listed for Cape Elizabeth alone at this time right now. Um, we really need to help not hinder people who want to farm. Um, pertaining to our blueberry farm, she went through some of the stuff on it. Um, we ended up hiring a landscape architect, a wetland specialist, a land surveyor for, tops, for topo topography, land surveyor for boundaries, and a soil scientist. And it was $35,000. Um, if we hadn't have spent that much money, we would have um, been able to install drip irrigation and 700 more plants. Um, it wouldn't be profitable for small farmers if they all had to shell out that kind of money in order to, I mean, we didn't build anything. This was just to say, you can plant blueberries. And, um, okay, thank you. Good evening. My name is Ray Chevenel. Uh, my wife Diane and I live at 189 Fowler Road. Uh, we, uh, we've been in the Cape since 1968. We bought uh, our land uh, which borders the Chad's property in 1975. Uh, and it borders uh, the property, the Chad's property on two sides, on the east side and on the north side. Um, a lot of has been said already about farming. I'd just like to add, thanks to the leadership and the members of the Cape Farm Alliance, farming in Cape Elizabeth has become a perfect fit for all the families and businesses wanting the many benefits of fresh food, locally grown fresh food. Our farming culture in the Cape and our farming sights and sounds are abundant here. The barns, the tractors, the pickup trucks, the greenhouses, the tilled fields in the spring, the strawberry plants each June, and the fall harvest. On Fowler Road alone, there are many barns and greenhouses. Directly across Fowler Road from Austin and Mary Ellen Chad's new home is a two-story barn. And in the backyard of the property right next to their backyard on the west side is a, a freestanding two-story garage. Cape, for a long time, has had a town policy to protect and preserve our rural character. The farms and our hardworking farmers and their families represent a very significant part of our rural character. Uh, Diane and I support Austin and Mary Ellen Chad's plans for their backyard, and we ask this board to allow them to move forward with their plans. Thank you. Thank you. Further public comment? <coughs> My name is Byron Castro. I live at 185 Fowler Road. Um, and first and foremost, I want to say that I do support 
even though people may not think by the end of this conversation, uh, I do, do support the farmlands. My biggest concern with this being done is wetlands. Um, we bought this house at 185 Fowler Road after looking at six houses prior. We actually looked at their house at one time and found that it had water issues in the backyard. It's very close to RP wetlands. Um, it also, after we started to buy the house at 185, we found out that we were shoreline restricted, where Great Pond restricted and RP1 restricted. So I had to go out myself and get a site plan done just to see about a 30 by 30 garage in the backyard. Um, my biggest concern is, is where the drainage is going. Their house, the three, four houses next beside theirs are the lowest houses in the, in the area. And their water either goes towards, sometimes goes to Great Pond, but most of the time it'll go back. And this, if I may put this up, all this is is a small section of this of this area is uh, this is whoops oh, sorry on this side this is the RP1 the wetlands that we have behind our uh, our houses right here and right here behind their houses is RP1 the wetlands it's small enough so it shouldn't have had where they're putting the their their um, greenhouse, but we're worried about the runoff because the closest part of all the water goes is towards the back. This is the lowest area in the area, other than the four house lots here. The water between behind your house goes between lot. I have to. You know, I don't want to say. I think there's this 191, uh, 193 splits a little bit of water between the two houses. Splits really bad behind the next house. So it really has water drainage issues. Um, I'm worried that when the, the farm does go there or any type of surface, we need to think about where the water's draining. I'm worried about the water coming back behind the yards and then creating more water, creating more water, or it might even create more water. So I know we looked at another house on those four lots and found out that the Cape Elizabeth Fire Department had to pump out three feet of water because we were out of power for over three days and the pump wasn't running. So Cape Fire Department had to drain water out of their house. So it's a real drainage issue. You can really see it if you drive down Follow Road in those four lots only. Um, as you get up towards my house, we're about six to eight feet above street level, but the backyards all do slope really, really low to behind uh, Mal uh, Bob Malley's house and all the way towards, towards uh, the other end of Fowler Road, towards this area. This also goes down towards the Spur Lake River. Um, and all, you have to worry about that. And again, we're in a weird zone where, where we qualify this as shorefront, I'll never know how because we've got a road that goes through here and shouldn't even be qualified as shorefront property, but it does, that's the point. And if you use the other map, which is another thing that the town has created for us, we have the Great Pond, which, as you can see, takes up the whole section of Fowler Road almost as the Great Pond. So there's another zone that you have to worry about as well as the RP. Lands. So, the only reason I know this is because the town planner, when we got to buy our house, the person who lived there before there moved out because he couldn't build in front of his house because of sure front. So, I found out about that, came to the town planner, the town planner told me, you better get a site review or get a, plan, a survey done because it's wet before we closed on our house. <coughs> this is how I found out about all this water issue. And that's my biggest concern. I hope very much for the best for the farm. Um, my only concern is what's going to happen to us. Uh, you know, if this is wet, tractors coming out of it. Um, we got shoreline front area that is the front part of the property shorefront. Actually, I think their house is actually in the shorefront, so I think um, that's that becomes another whole different issue. But that's my biggest concern: is where is all this water going to go? And again, if it, if it's a small area. 
I think it might be able to be, something might be able to be done, but I think that's got to be concerned. I'm not against it. I'm worried about the water and the water backing up over in our house. And it's going to go, where if it's got fertilizer, you've got to worry about fertilizer or anything like that. But those are some of the things that I think needs to be addressed. Um, it's not against the farm, but what are we going to do with the water at runoff is the biggest concern. I think that's what we got to keep addressed. If you can address by that, I think, I think they're home free, to be honest with you. But I think this has to be part of the, part of the application of where the water's going. Uh, any questions? Oops, sorry. I, 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 I just wanted to comment that I, I did review the resource protection standards and the Great Pond watershed overlay standards, and I believe the proposal complies with both of those standards. Uh, I, did, I didn't do any sort of stormwater review, but I did review for resource protection and Great Pond watershed overlay. Thank you, Ben. Further uh, public comment? My name is David Buchanan. I'm with the Cape Farm Alliance, and I'm reading a letter for Janet Villiot, a Cape resident from 7 Mont Montgomery Terrace, dated yesterday, 24th of March, and said, to the members of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board of Appeals, I'm writing in support of Mary Ellen and Austin Chad's application to construct the hoop house on their Fowler Road property. I regret that family commitments prevent me from attending the hearing and voicing my thoughts personally. As you're all aware, Cape Elizabeth has a long and rich agricultural history, which is carried into the present day. Many of our local farms have been in the same families for hundreds of years. It is a part of what makes our town unique. The fact that Cape Elizabeth is considered desirable by a young couple to begin their farm venture speaks volumes about our community's shared values. Mary Ellen and Austin have demonstrated a commitment to sustainable organic farming practices. Through their raising of heirloom plants, they're preserving horticultural history. They've been an active presence in Cape, supportive of Judy's Food Pantry, and part of the Cape Farm Alliance, as well as the larger agricultural community in our region. Chad's commitment to excellence in farming and to treading lightly on our planet has won them a loyal following, myself among them, and a measure of success in a business that can be incredibly difficult. In order to allow their efforts to expand, the hoop house is a natural step forward. I cannot fathom why such a low-impact structure would be at issue, as they seek the appropriate permits for its construction. It's within the permitted uses for the land the Chads occupy. I urge you all to consider approving this permit, thus allowing Cape's farming tradition to take another step forward. And she gives her contact information. I'll pass this on to you. <coughs> Sincerely, Janet Filiot. And on a personal note, I, I want to say that I've been leasing land as a grower here in Cape for the past seven years along Old, Old, Old Ocean House Road. And I can tell you what a challenge it is to find places to grow. And I also have a stand at the Portland Farmers Market, as the Chads do. And so I've watched their business grow. And I know uh, how much support they have in the community and what a fantastic job they do and how much of an asset they are to Cape Elizabeth. And I hope the town can tonight return the favor. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, sorry, can we? Thank you. <coughs> Further public comment? Good evening. As you may have guessed, I'm not a farmer. And I, I apologize for that. But I have, uh, I have a full uh, set of sprouts up uh, in the third floor window, and we're excited for spring if it would get here. Uh, my name is Nate Hucklebauer. I'm an attorney uh, out of that cesspool uh, city to the north, Portland. And I'm representing today uh, Brian and Wendy Tate, who live at 193 uh, Fowler Road, immediately adjacent to the Chaz property. And I'm here, uh, Brian and Wendy could not attend tonight. I'm here, uh, we're here in support of uh, the decision of the code officer uh, right now, we're not arguing that this use is not permitted, just arguing that a change of use like this should go through site plan review. Now, one of the concerns that was raised that, is that site plan review is very expensive. Uh, site plan review, I believe, uh, some, of the some of the requirements can be waived. Uh, 
if they look and say, you know what, that's not a real big concern right here. We can waive one of those requirements. But the issue here has already been presented, one of uh, the impact on the neighbors. Where's the water going to go? Where, right now, this is, it's a residential house. Uh, my clients have, uh, it's their backyard. They've got a pool back there. It's been a private place. And now this is a, it is a different use. Uh, it is a, it, whether it's residential or non-residential, if it's not a house, it's not residential. So this is a different type of use. And whether it's an electric golf cart or a truck or a tractor, there's going to be a lot more activity back there. And there's the, the, the whole point of site plan review is to say, how is this different use going to impact the neighbors? And what can we do to minimize that? Why should someone move into the neighborhood and say, I'm going to impose my will on you, and I'm not going to be a considerate neighbor. I'm not going to minimize my impact on you. I'm just going to do exactly what I want. The site plan process says, look at what's around you. How can you minimize your, your impact on existing uses? This, the, the backyard is, is practically open for these four lots, four houses here. These are small lots. They're, they're, not, the, they're not the two acre or nearly two acre minimum lot size for this zone. They're closer to one and a half lots, uh, one and a half acres. And everyone's right on top of each other, basically. This, the, the proposed uh, structure is only about 90 feet from the, the, the um, lot line. And it, it's really quite close. It's, uh, all of this activity is going to be going on in, in a place that previously has been a very, uh, has been strictly residential, a very quiet, private place. And so, you know, my client's primary concern is that this change of use is going to have an impact on these neighbors, on other neighbors. And at a minimum, this should go through a process to minimize those impacts and try to address the neighborhood concerns about a use that's very important uh, to Cape Elizabeth. But the fact is that there, there is a house next door. The house is allowed to be there. And this is a new use that's going to impose some externalities, some noise, uh, some, some drainage issues, and some uh, a visual chains. Now, again, right now, I'm not saying that you can't do this, but the point is that you're, you have to interpret the ordinance, and it says that a, a non-residential change of use requires site plan review. And, and as the code officer has said, if if all agriculture uses did not need site plan review, why is there a section that exempts certain agri agricultural uses? So you, you really have to focus on one of the, the tenets of interpreting an ordinance is to interpret it in a way that would not make other parts of the ordinance completely void, and, and also to not uh, make the ordinance absurd in some way, to say that well, we're going to do this type of activity, and it might involve a tractor, and we're going to build a structure. And just because we say that it's agriculture instead of some other business activity, we don't need to go through site plan review, even though we may have the same impact. One, one of the, you know, the, 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 the Chad's house and their driveway and some of the other structures there are all within the shoreland setback. Uh, or the shoreland overlay. And the, the, the shoreland o overlay part of the ordinance talks about um, what you can do within the portion of your lot that is within the shoreland overlay. And right now, there, it says you cannot have more than 20% of that portion of your lot have an impervious surface. Now, they've already exceeded that. that they didn't do that. that that's pre-existing. But you can't add anything to that. So, you know, we don't know, and they, tonight they've said we will get out there with a, a wheelbarrow and a golf cart, but it doesn't seem realistic to think that at some point they'll be stuck in the mud and they'll have to pave it or put down gravel to get to that back uh, yard. And that's going to be going through a damp area. It's going to be increasing impervious surface in the shoreland zone. And I, I think, again, that's part of, that's what site plan is for, to look at what, what's going on here, and let's make sure that it's minimizing the impact 
on the other neighbors, on the existing uses, on the established uses. Um, I do have a, a little letter I'd just like to submit. It, it, uh, it closely mirrors the CEO's uh, comments, and it's mostly just for purposes of the record. If anyone would like a copy, I have several copies. And I'd be happy to answer any questions, or at least try to. Thank you. Thank you. Further public comment? I'm Louise Sullivan. I live at 72 Two Lights Road. It says Journey's End Farm on my barn. Um, I live in the middle of a neighborhood and raise sheep. <laughs> I've taken time out from the lambing barn here for a moment. Bill Bamford spoke about how um, farmers have different time. And um, as I was listening to this, the comments tonight and appreciating what Nick Camero said about the cost of your site plan and what the Bothell said about the cost of preparing for theirs, there's another cost to site plan review, and it's the cost of time. Um, this, you know, time is always on the farmer's mind, and time is on the Chad's mind right now. So, it, you know, to make this a long process and to put um, stones in the way of what, you know, we call ourselves a proud uh, Cape Elizabeth, a, a proud fishing and farming community that's where we all live, um, is just something we really need to think about in, in doing this process. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Further public comment? Good evening. My name is uh, Tony Owens. I live on Seaview Avenue where, where my wife Beth and I have maintained an organic vegetable uh, and fruit garden, apiary and flower garden for over three decades. I'm here to speak in support of the appeal of Austin and Mary Allen Chad. My arguments in favor of their appeal are based on three issues which I'll briefly summarize. First, my reading of the regulations regarding the issuance of a building permit strongly favors the CHAD's interpretation. Secondly, the town's own comprehensive plan encourages the preservation <coughs> of agricultural use within the town, and its implementation has been a major initiative of the town itself, as well as the allied organizations of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust, the Farm Alliance, and the Maine Farmland Trust. Thirdly, during my recent tenure as the President of the Board of Directors of the Natural Resources Council of Maine, a 15,000 member organization advocating for the protection of the nature of Maine, I became acutely aware of the conspicuous absence of younger generations of Mainers committed to a sustainable future for our state. Absent for many reasons, including the lack of a viable economic alternative, with the CHADS application, we have a desirable nexus of farmland protection and retention of the next generation of young, ambitious, hardworking Mainers. For these reasons, I strongly encourage your favorable review of their appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. My name is Patty Kreitzer, and I grew up at 200 Fowler Road, directly across from the CHADS. I just want to confirm that it is not a new use. Um, as a young girl, I played in those fields. It was owned and operated by Parker Brown, who grew potatoes and carrots for many, many years until he sold it in the 70s to build 10 houses. There was never a water issue. The fields were always dried. Um, and in, uh, So if you look back maybe at the water levels back in the 70s, there was really not an issue having a wetland. Um, so I, I feel like it's not a new use. Um, it's been farmed for many years prior to the 70s until the houses came in. So thank you. Chair, I have a question. Um, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, did Parker Brown live on the land? He did. And what was the address of that land at that time? Uh, you know what? The house has been torn down and rebuilt. Um, I, I couldn't tell you off the record. Would you say to the left or to the right of oh, 191 uh, Fowler Road? Uh, to the right. Okay. Thank you. Right. 
Well, if you're looking at your house from Great Pond Farm, it would be on the left. But if you're at 191, it would be on your right. Uh, my name is Alice Grant. I live at 61 Beach Bluff Terrace. Um, and I'd like to support the uh, Chad's appeal. Um, and I just wanted to focus on the section 19-9-2B, um, um, that says activities not requiring site plan review include agricultural buildings as follows, any barn, greenhouse, or storage shed with a building footprint that does not exceed 2,000 square feet in size. And I don't see anything in here that limits that to whether you're selling the produce or, um, or you're not, um, or, uh, you know, adding it to an existing farm or, or really any limitation. So, um, and agriculture is approved in that zone. Um, so I just uh, think they should be allowed to have a permit without going through the more cost, more costly process. Thank you. Yeah, my, my name is Tom Gallagher. I've lived across the street from the charity for 60 years. And the reason why the field is wet is because it was all drained. When the farmers farmed the field, they put clay pipes all the way around the field and drained it down to, to its Sprague Hall, and it went into Great Pond. And when the town let them build houses in there, they dug up the clay tiles on every house lot there, so there was no place for the water to go. Now the water runs across the street onto my property. I've got three different types of grass on my pasture there where the chemicals come down. There's two six-inch pipes that run under the road. I've addressed the town manager. I addressed the uh, road commissioner on it. Nothing's ever been done about it. But the reason why it's wet is because the drain's not there. There was a, a clay tile all the way around the field, and um, they tore it up. So there's no place for the water to come, but over my property or out back. And, that's it. and it was a farm field there for many, many years. Thank you. I have a question. Did you say you had, you were is, that you were that your property across the street? Yes. Get, it gets what? You have, the th you have the three shades of grass. Three different shades of grass in my pasture, where the animals wouldn't eat because of the stuff coming down from the driveway. <coughs> As you get up towards 77, this way the houses are higher, so everything in their driveway comes off their roof, comes off their lawn, comes over my property whether it's fertilizer, whether it's bait juice, whether it's gasoline, whether it's soap. It, there's no drainage on the road. <coughs> so the town should have drained the road or put drains in there, or, you know, catch basins or whatever when they built the houses, but they never did. So there's no place for the water to go. That's not the chance fault. That's not state's fault. It's not my fault. It's the town's. So when I went to school, which was in this building, it wasn't the town hall, it was school. I'd walk home and work in that field there. For Teddy Wainwright found it for many years. He rented it for the Browns or, or Vernon Brown found it there. It was always a field, always grew vegetables. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Beth Engel. I live off of Fickett on Young Lane. I have a little farm. Sometimes I raise dairy heifers. I've got some horses, chickens. But mostly, I'm a real estate broker. And if I had read, well, I was aware that the Cape Farm Alliance, which I belong to, worked on the ordinance. I listened to John quite a bit, read it after it was done. And as a real estate broker, if I would had a buyer who wanted that piece of property, and they asked me, can I put up a hoop house here and grow plants in it? I'd have told them, yeah. So it's a little wolfsome to me that I'm very bright and I read this ordinance and I would have said to these people, yes, you can, that's agriculture use, you can put up a hoop house and grow plants there. And uh, it worries me that you think I might have been wrong. Um, I hope the Chads can do this. They have a great organic farm. 
they're an asset to our community. Thank you. Thank you. Further public comment? Yes, sir. <clears throat> My name's uh, Jay Cox. I have a Christmas tree farm on Sawyer Road. And I just wanted to um, comment on some of the intent. Uh, you know, I've heard things like uh, change of use and, and different uh, uh, ideas about what we had in mind when we drafted these changes to the ordinance. And I just want to point out one, uh, an, one example of the fact that we certainly had no intent that there would be any site plan review for beginning new agriculture. I went through site plan review for my uh, barn and farm stand, but it's a, it's a commercial building. Um, the ordinance is clear that required site plan review. But from the farm committee's uh, uh, side, and to my knowledge, never from the town, was there an, ever any intent that there be review, a site plan review to commence new agriculture. And I can give you one example of, of uh, why I feel that, or some evidence of that, I guess. Um, there was a lot of back and forth. We looked at a lot of parts of the ordinance. We, looked, we worked hard on the definition of agriculture and all sorts of different things. When, in one memo that came back to us on 10-2009, and this was uh, drafted by the planner to go to the planning board, a new definition appeared, which was agricultural related use. And agri agricultural related use covered items that w would be ancillary to agriculture, like an ice cream stand or uh, any activity that could support the primary uh, function of farming to provide more profit. Um, that was proposed to be, uh, that was proposed to be, um, this was to give the town some control over these type of activities to make sure we didn't get too far afield. That was the thinking. Um, how, this was proposed to, be go, to go before the zoning board for approval of those types of ancillary activities, not agriculture. There was, agriculture was a separate definition, and there was never any suggestion or any requirement that agriculture per se require review before commencing. The ancillary activities, yes, they wanted some, some oversight. However, we went back to them, and I won't bother reading all our, uh, our response, but basically we said we want those combined. Um, we don't want the ancillary, ancillary activities carved out. Um, subsequent to that, uh, to our uh, opposing that, the final ordinance uh, did retain a separate definition However, the review requirement was pulled. There's no review requirement for these ancillary activities or agriculture-related activities. That was pulled. Agriculture remained a permitted use in all zones except the town center, and it remained under uh, resource-related use. Resource-related use uh, includes timber harvesting, uh, topsoil removal, and none of those activities require site plan review. So that's one point. And then, just on uh, greenhouses and smaller structures, I think the attorney that spoke for uh, one of the families on Fowler Road said that, or brought up a point that um, if it weren't for a review requirement, why would these buildings be carved out as not requiring review? The reason for that is we went back and forth. Initially, we had proposed that um, that no agricultural buildings would require, require review. And the, on 10-2009, the town proposed wording that exempted temporary, certain temporary buildings. And they were very specific. They were very small, temporary. There was a time restriction on how, how long during the year activity could take place there. And in our comments back to the town saying, well, we really don't like that, we said, we're also concerned that buildings such as greenhouses and sheds that are currently exempt, because under the original ordinance that we worked from, uh, agricultural buildings were exempt. Uh, greenhouses and sheds that are currently exempt from site plan review appear to now require site plan review under, under the new draft. We feel that agricultural buildings that are not used for conducting sales, barns, sheds, greenhouses, etc., are accessory buildings that should only require a building permit for construction, and requiring such review would create an unreasonable burden. 
we feel that site plan review should be required for larger and more permanent buildings to be used for sales as the sales will generate vehicular traffic, pedestrian traffic, and have a greater impact on the immediate area. So we propose that uh, the text be modified to indicate that site plan review is not required for non-sales agricultural buildings, greenhouses, storage sheds, and barns, and that certain sales buildings be exempt if they were used on a temporary basis. And that's how the ordinance ended up. So my point is uh, the reason that the section, that section of, of 19.9 references specific agricultural buildings is because that's to separate them from larger buildings that do, in fact, require site plan review. So that's all I got. Thank you. Any questions? Can I ask one question? Jay. Uh, in 2009, the zoning ordinance, uh, under that section that you were just speaking of, said uh, agricultural activities in buildings were, were exempt. And so, so then it was changed to what we have now, yep. which seems much more restrictive than the 2009 language. Because when, you know, when you say, if, if the zoning ordinance said what it said in 2009, the exemption is agricultural activities and buildings, I mean, that's a no-brainer. That's black and white, agricultural activities and buildings. We, can, can you reflect on what the frame of mind was for, for that change, and did it get more restrictive accidentally? Or If, if it got more restrict, restrictive, it was an accident. I know at the same time uh, Maureen was going through and pulling redundant language, uh, I can only surmise that because agriculture is permitted in all the different zones as a resource-related use, that it's redundant to say that. We were talking about that section of the uh, site plan uh, ordinance referred to buildings. Yep. So maybe it was pulled for that reason, but I can't tell you. It was not because we intended to make it more restrictive, and to my knowledge, it was not intended on the town's part to make it more restrictive. So it, it, it could have been pulled it, by accident. It, 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 What's that? It was indeed for buildings. Because it was building specifically. That, were, yeah. that, that was something that confused me because it did seem like the intent of that change was proposed by the Cape Farm Alliance, or the, the change was proposed by the Cape Farm Alliance, uh, yet you, it took out the phrase agricultural activity, which, nope. was, which was a key phrase, I think, to keep in the zoning ordinance, and, and that may have just been an oversight. No, the Cape Farm Alliance never uh, recommended pulling that, that phrase. I went back and reviewed all that. That was never a recommendation from us. Right. What we would do is we would submit documentation to staff, and staff would make changes to make it efficient right. and legal, and that was pulled by town staff. Okay. So I, I think uh, the fact that we narrowed it down to buildings requiring site plan review is the reason. Uh, if that's not the reason, it would have to be an oversight or just for efficiency. Okay, thank you. I'd just like to clarify that point. Um, he was correct. It was uh, removed because it would have been redundant. Um, agriculture was allowed. Sorry, can you restate your name for the record? I'm sorry, John Green. Thank you. Um, uh, what happened was uh, we were focusing in on buildings that required site plan review, so we moved out markets and things that would indeed require it. Agriculture uh, itself uh, was allowed as a resource-related use, so that was removed out only because we were not dealing with the use, which was already allowed, so we just stuck with buildings. What would trigger site plan review for agricultural buildings? So it was not an oversight. It was just how, uh, it was, uh, how we chose to address it as to not be redundant, I guess. Thanks. Any further public comment? I'm Diane Chevenel. My husband Ray was up a while ago. I promise I'll be very brief. But uh, we live at 189 Fowler and we are directly next door to the Chads. And we couldn't be happier to have them as neighbors. We've enjoyed their wonderful produce for the last few years when we can get it. And I would be thrilled to see a hoop house there growing vegetables through the winter and all year round. Um, and I just don't see a problem with having something like that in your own backyard 
taking the produce, putting it in a truck or however they want to get it back and forth, bringing it to their farm and into the farmers' markets, I see no difference than my getting in my car in the morning and go to work to try to make a living. And I just don't think it'll be a problem. I think it'll be a real asset, and we hope that you'll approve of their wishes. Thank you. Any further public comment? Any of the board have questions for um, the Chads before we close questioning period? No? Okay, thank you. Um, I guess let's move to the uh, board discussion. Um, I, I guess I just had a quick question for Ben. Um, other than your interpretation of the ordinance, um, was there any other reason that you would not have permitted um, the application? In other words, does it, does it comply with all other requirements? Yes, I reviewed it for resource protection, shoreland zoning, great pond, watershed overlay, and uh, setbacks, every, everything else. Okay. It was simply an interpretation of review authority. And, and, and again, specifically, it's 1992 two. So this 19922 is any non-residential expansion or change in use. Correct. Ben, can, can you summarize why you don't think uh, section 1992B3 applies? Where I, my interpretation was that Section B applies to existing farms and is intended to allow existing farms to expand with, without site plan review, uh, but that the use, uh, that the change of use is still triggered above. Spotlight day, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean, your your interpretation um, that that section nineteen nine two B three C only applies to continued use what's that based on uh, it's well you, you first the, the first section talks about uses and the second section talks about buildings and I think you have in my interpretation is you have to have the use in order to have the building uh, and you know if as I stated before, if the uh, if the greenhouse was residential in nature, I, I would have approved it. I do think a, a greenhouse is allowed as an accessory structure to residential. It's the question of non-residential to residential. What? No. I mean, just is the sorry. Chair. No, go ahead. Isn't that the crux of the question? Is that merely because the applicant is going to sell a particular carrot, it converts it from residential to a non-commercial uh, use, and within the concept of non-residential, non excuse me, includes commercial or agricultural. Is that what we're talking about? Well, but doesn't. I mean, there's. When you look at the the sec, uh, resident residence A district 1961, and it lists the permitted uses, and I mean non residential use, there's also resource related uses. So there's actually a whole separate category, separate and apart from non residential uses, which are resource related uses, which include agriculture. 
So I actually I read. This isn't a. They're not. They're not. This isn't a non-residential use. This is a resource-related use. That is the purpose of the building of the greenhouse. Ben just mentioned that if it was for personal residential use, they could build the hoop house. Is that right? Yes. So then what is the tipping of the scale? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's a resource-related use. That it's, it, you, you can look at it as a resource-related use that's being used in a residential fashion or a resource-related use that's being used in a not residential fashion. But is that, where in the ordinance does it differentiate those two? Well, that, that would be section two of 19.9. Uh, 19.9.2 where... yeah. A and B. Yeah. I mean, I, I look at 19.9.2 A and B, I'm just thinking and, and processing this out loud. See, I see 1992A is activities requiring site plan review, and 1992B is activities not. So under those activities is agricultural buildings. So I mean, it, I mean the, the headings of A and B are, are activities. Now obviously a, a greenhouse isn't an activity, but you're performing an activity within the greenhouse. So just my reading of the language, I mean, I'm, I think it, it's allowed under 19, 1992B3C. That's, that's a reasonable interpretation. I mean, there, there's a very reasonable interpretation to allow it. Uh, I, I looked at it and I looked at past ordinances and, and how the ordinance structure changed over the years. Uh, in 1995, for example, the, uh, it wasn't, there, w there were no resource related uses. There was just a list of uses, but the site plan section was written exactly the same, uh, a, a non-residential use. And then, and, and then the resource related category took it out of that. And I'm not sure that it was intended to be removed from site plan review. I, I read all the ordinances. I read all the charter uh, document, uh, uh, com comprehensive plan documents I could, uh, looking for something concrete on that subject that, you know, hoping to find something concrete on that subject that took it out of, that they intended to take agriculture out of site plan review. And, and I, I couldn't find anything. So, I, that, so that's how I weighed my decision. But I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a very reasonable interpretation to allow it without site plan review. They, they make a valid case. I, mean, I, think, I think, yeah, unfortunately, 1992-2 just, I, my, my brain's trying to get past it. I mean, I, I look 1992-2A-2? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, was, yeah. I forgot my A. You're right. I'm sorry. My apologies. The, 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 the non-residential expansion or change in use. And, and I, I'm, I see that, but then I go and, I, and I'm looking at 1961. 19, I mean, you can go right down the list. It's, it's agriculture is, is a resource-related use that's, that's a lot. Um, so, so me meaning that this section on non-residential doesn't apply. Uh, 1992, 19, 19-9-2. When, when, when I look at that, coupled with activities not requiring site plan review, I, you know, I kind of, I don't, I don't think it requires, and, and I, I think, I don't think it requires site plan review, um, particularly now that I've heard that, that Ben also has taken a look at this from, from the resource protection standpoint as well, and it's compliant there. I mean, if there were issues there, then I... Right. I mean, all, all the only thing that's really before the board right now is the interpretation of, at least as, as I view it, is the interpretation of the ordinance as applied to the denial of the permit, because as Ben stated, there would have been no other reason to deny the permit other than 
his interpretation of the ordinance. And interpretation it is. I think that the ordinance should probably be revisited in some fashion, but I think when you do interpret it, so long as there aren't any pigs or chickens out there or cows, then I think it, it appears to me that the greenhouse is, is a permitted use. I wouldn't comment on the pigs or chickens or cows. I'm that's that's I, <laughs> um, well, I'm just looking at 1961B1B, and, and that specifically permits agricultural use on lots, so, unless right. farm animals are involved. Right. No farm animals. Um, any, any further thoughts or, or comments from the board? Again, I mean, the general sense that I'm hearing is um, that it seems like the appeal should be granted. Um, are there any thoughts on the other side of that that we should discuss through? Um, just merely because I believe John was at the hearing um, in 2011, dealing with the wild. Well, I, I think I, well, I didn't say that, but that's true. I mean, I, I listened when that came up. I mean, I, I do, when, when this board or any board kind of rules in a particular way on a, on a prior fact pattern. I mean, obviously it's a little, well, the address is different, but I mean, it's the same fact pattern. I, I, you know, I, I don't like to see boards being inconsistent in rulings either. The reason I mentioned that, I, 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 I with the little um, effort, I, I found or located a copy of, of those minutes. And the, 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 some of the discussion is not of the board speaking. It's suggest that it's actually uh, the former CEO speaking. So um, on the one hand, we're not necessarily bound by those minutes because I, I think that there's some suggestion that it's not actually the board actually holding. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I mean, they made a decision. So that's why perhaps your recollection couldn't help us with some of the issues that we're facing here. I'm lucky if I can remember anything you know, three months ago. OK. Um, I, I guess the, the other issue that I had is that um, Um, you know, in the past, when someone's doing com a commercial activity at home, we've gone through the process of uh, it's a home business, home occupation. Why doesn't that apply here? Because it's because the ordinance specifically carves out agricultural use as something different from a home business. All right, and so then then it gets back into the issue that we talked about resource use, um, 1961. B, one, B, um, and essentially this falls within that that subcategory dealing with um, commercial purposes on any lot less than one hundred thousand square feet. So we are assuming that that fits with the square foot requirement. That's a big greenhouse. Well, it's the, not the, the, the lot it's itself, lot. Oh, not, the lot. not the lot. I'm sorry. Ben, ben had a comment on that. That's a section for livestock, I believe. Uh, that's down to C, sir. I was referring to B. Uh, you yeah, know, if, I think if that you're, right. if you're raising animal or fowl, you need a hundred thousand square feet on the lot. No, but even B, even B has a limitation. No, I, I think the way the way I read it is. Agriculture is permitted, provided that no animal or fowl shall be raised for commercial purposes on the lot containing less than. So I think right. for non-animal um, raising, you're right. Yep. The, this, the, the lot limitation does not apply. All right. So what what section are you suggesting um, this activity would fall within then? 1961B. 1961B1B. And what under under the sub the following uh, resource related use agriculture? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, what we, the one that we just talked about then? So the subparagraph B. Okay. Right. I'm glad we got there. <laughs> any any other? Mike, you look like you're about to say something. Now or uh, either I'll, I'll say something. I, I, I think Ben's interpretation is, uh, is certainly reasonable. Uh, I think the ordinance is confusing.
confusing. Uh, I found that hearing from members of the Cape Farm Alliance that uh, were part of the process of uh, drafting the ordinance was very helpful. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I think I agree with the rest of the board members in that, that, that uh, it doesn't require a site plan review because it's Less than 2,000 square feet in size, and it's a it's a resource related use. And just to state the obvious, that there's only, so I understood, only two parties that have objected to the application. Correct. Okay, uh, and then on the other policy issues is that um, the town's policy to support our agriculture. Are you looking for other reasons to? Approve the application. So we have one, two, those are two points there. Um, and then the query that I had earlier about whether the, a prior use from the original source of the land is important. Granted, you know, there was a farm at one time, but whether that use just gets drifted away and does not apply here. Just points for consideration. Yeah, I mean, you know, my view from it, you know, I think the, or, the ordinance is not clear, and I think it can be interpreted in, in two different ways, I think, um, or interpreted. Um, and uh, I think when you add what we've heard from the farming community and the Cape Farm Alliance as to the reasons, I, I think it was a considered uh, process whereby they changed the ordinance so these types of greenhouses could be built without going through site <coughs> Um, so that, that seems like that was the intent behind some of these changes, um, which, uh, you know, when, when you read the ordinance, you can see why some of these changes were made. Um, and, and one way of interpreting it is to allow this without a site plan review. Anybody want to make a motion? I tried that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take a crack at it again. Um, I'll make a motion that um, the administrative appeal of Austin Chad concerning the issuance of a building permit dated February 12, 2014 is permit number 140031 be upheld. Did the appeal be upheld or grant, granted? Granted. 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 I like granted. I didn't want to say denied. That. Right. So. <laughs> granted. Second. Uh, can we? I'm sorry. Can we? I think, I think Mike just second. Seconded. And second. Oh. Can I ask you to repeat the motion one more time? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll make a motion that. The administrative appeal of Austin Chad concerning the issuance of a building permit um, dated February 12, 2014, as permit number 140031 be granted. Okay, and we had a second? Yes. All in favor? The appeal is granted uh, 5 nothing. Um, and let me just read the findings of fact. Um, number one, this is an administrative chair. chair. Can, can I make one suggestion when we get when we get there? Yes. That that uh, perhaps we add to the finding of facts a, a couple of the sections that we're we're relying upon. Sure. Um, specifically, yep. 1961B1B, which is the resource related use for agriculture and 19, 9, 99, 1992B3C. Okay. And I can. Yeah, no. Um, 
So one, this is an administrative appeal of the code enforcement officer's decision to deny a building permit for an accessory structure at 191 Fowler Road, map U44, lot 28. Two, the appellants are Austin and Mary Ellen Chad, who reside at 191 Fowler Road. Three, on February 3rd, 2014, Austin Chad submitted the building permit application number 140031 for an accessory building. Four, on February 6th, 2014, the code enforcement officer spoke with Austin Chad on the telephone. And Mr. Chad stated that he intended to use the proposed accessory structure for his produce business that is currently operating at a different location. Five, on February 12th, 2014, the code enforcement officer denied the application for an accessory structure. Six, on March 10th, 2014, Austin Chad submitted an application for an administrative appeal to appeal the code enforcement officer's decision to deny the building permit. Um, and then seven will be um, Section 19-6-1, um, entitled Residence A, District RA, B, Permitted Uses, 1, uh, B, states that the following resource-related uses are permitted in the Residence A District, um, and B is agriculture, uh, provided that no animal or fowl shall be raised for commercial purposes, on any lot containing less than 100,000 square feet. Um, and we're also, re and so, we're also relying on section 19-9-2 um, B, which uh, is entitled activities not requiring site plan review and that includes under B, B3, agricultural buildings, ag agricultural buildings as follows. B3, C, any barn, greenhouse, or storage shed with a building footprint that does not exceed 2,000 square feet in size. Any other findings? Do you want to make a comment about the support by the abutters? <coughs> sure. Uh, I mean, we've, we've heard, well, let me write this down, so. Or um, a lively public debate or discussion. Yeah, I mean. Um, I'm not sure that lively. Was, well, I mean, that's part of the record, right? Yes. You want to. It's just the two abutters, I'm sorry, one abutter said no, but two abutters said yes. Okay, um, we heard from two um, abutters who were in favor of the uh, construction of the greenhouse. Any other findings of that? Okay. Um, all in favor? Do you want to go as far as saying that agriculture is not a non-residential use? Because I do believe that's a crux of the interpretation and it's something that wasn't clearly stated in the Bothell Bothwell Aren't we effectively you, you are, saying you are, that? You are effectively doing it, but you, you don't have to add it. I mean, I, I, mean, I think I, I don't, I mean, I'm comfortable with the granting of the appeal and the findings yeah. of fact, and I think. You, know, you don't want to rewrite the ordinance? I do not want to rewrite the ordinance. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the ordinance was somewhat clear that there may be forms of agriculture that could be commercial or non-residential in nature. So yeah, I agree. I don't think we need to go any further. Okay. Um, so all in favor of the uh, findings of fact? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Chad. Great.
could have dragged him. That's fine. Horn. Michael Chestnut, representing Candice Carew of 412 Pulsic Hawk Road, to construct an accessory dwelling unit in a portion of a proposed house at 5 Old Ocean House Road, map R2-1, lot 10-1. Hello, I'm Michael Chestnut. Hi. Thank, thank you for your patience. Uh, you're welcome. It was very interesting. <laughs> so, yeah, as you just stated, um, the lot on 5 Old Los Angeles Road, we are going to be building a new single family residence with an attached garage and we are trying to get approval for an accessory dwelling unit above the garage. And any comments? I'd maybe start there from the board or questions. Section 1975, and I have it on page 154, on or about. That's what I was going to say. If you want me to take you through what we're planning. Yeah, I just want to walk us through the 19-7-5B uh, uh, requirements for the creation of uh, an accessory dwelling unit. Why the proposed accessory dwelling unit meets the requirement. Okay, the, the first one is the minimum lot size. Is we have 160,000, um, so we have plenty of, plenty of lot size. And um, the floor area... Of the, of the new structure will be 3,220 square feet, um, which is over the 1,500 required as a minimum. And we're not, we're going to be well, actually less than the 25% in three because we're only allowed to go to 600 square feet, which we are at 591. Yes, 591 on the application, which is 18.4% of the 3,220. I'm not quite sure. I, I'd like to get an opinion on four. I'm not quite sure if I understand four, to be honest. <laughs> I was reading it before I came, and it says, any addition to the floor area of the single-family detached dwelling to create the accessory dwelling unit shall not exceed 15% of the floor area of the structure of the single-family dwelling prior to conversion. That's a single, it is a, the single family home is being built at the same time, right? Correct. Yeah. That's where I'm existing. Yeah, that, I mean, that is one nuance to this, whether the existing versus proposed that we have. Uh, it, specifically, as far as uh, Point number four is concerned. There, there, there is no addition to the house for the accessory dwelling unit because it's going above the garage, so it would be zero percent in increase uh, because uh, you know. If, oh, I what, see what, what you're saying. What he could do yeah. is build this structure with uh, a bonus room or unfinished space above the garage. And then he could come here and say, I would, 
I'd like to do an accessory dwelling unit above the garage. There is no expansion of the existing structure. It's mm -hmm. just going above the garage. Uh, the, the applicant uh, would feel more comfortable having the approval up front. It's, it's a pretty big investment into the lot. They actually have the lot size. To, they, they could have two lots here. They have uh, over 160,000 square feet. Uh, so they could have two RA zone lots. They have plenty of frontage. Uh, the issue was, and I, I told Mr. Chestnut, you, you are allowed to build two dwellings, but they have to be 60 feet apart because the zoning says you have to leave the opportunity to divide the lot. We went back to his client, and his client didn't want didn't want them that far apart. It's, it's basically it, it's an apartment for fit when family visits, and they didn't want to have to walk you know 60 feet outside when when her when her children visit her. And she's actually planning on moving there herself in who knows how many decades when she gets older. She's going to move up to the apartment we're talking about and probably give it to her daughter and the rest of the... I also notice in the second sentence in the first paragraph, it says the creation of a subordinate accessory dwelling unit within a new single family dwelling unit shall also be permitted. Where, where is this now? Second sentence in the first paragraph, A. But a lot of the language, even going to five, no, sorry, six, starts talking again about alteration. So it seems to be geared towards adding to existing, but yet the second sentence clearly states that it can also be part of a new single family dwelling too. Can I ask a, I just got this question. Why is this before us? You, the approval of an accessory dwelling unit is a conditional use approval that only the zoning board can grant. Right. <laughs> right, but I think maybe you said it's, it, it's like a bonus from over, I mean, it's, it's new construction. The whole thing's new construction. Yes. But they, when, when he executes the building permit, he'd like to be able to execute the building permit for the whole structure you see, the, the house along with the accessory dwelling unit over the garage. Okay. It, versus if the zoning board says that there has to be a house on the site in order for us to consider this, um, then the applicant would be forced to uh, submit a building permit and say that the, there was going to be a bonus room or storage space above the garage. And then once the house is built and had, has a certificate of occupancy, they could then come in and uh, fit out the accessory and get approval from the board to fit out the accessory apartment. It would obviously be less expensive for them to build it at the same time, and the client would be assured of being able to use the property as she wishes. Okay. And, and this is considered an ADU because it's a it's a structure, if you will, detached. Well, it's it's a full dwelling unit above the garage, and yeah. the the only way someone can have a second dwelling unit on their on their property okay. is either to yep. separate them by 60 feet, as I said before, right. double the lot size. Or have 10 acres, and then you can do a duplex. Mm -hmm. if, yep. Yeah, and if you have 10 <laughs> acres, you can yep. duplex. And I wasn't sure if I was reading that creation of a subordinate accessory dwelling unit. I don't know where, why subordinate was in there, but would that be what we're doing, in which case it is allowed to be in a new single family dwelling? not just an existing. That's where the, the second sentence I was yeah, that, that's asking good. about. That's I wasn't sure. <clears throat> um, Chair, Josh, yeah. uh, I'm a little, I think I'm with John here. The lot is huge. Yes. Um, 
I don't mind if we take as long as it takes. <laughs> uh, however, we're looking at a lot that's three and a half, almost four, four acres. And if we, if hypothetically, if, if the two structures are divided and 60 feet are there, it would pass muster. So if we join them, and essentially they should still pass muster unless something off that list of the 1975B1 uh, through 8. And we're down to five already. Is that right? I think we're down to five. Number yes. Yeah. This should be fairly straightforward as to the process by which we um, move along. Um, I mean, I'm going down six, it seems like applies to uh, alterations. Alterations, yeah. and that's not going to be applicable here since it's new construction. Seven is no accessory dwelling unit shall be approved for any structure that includes a home occupation or business. She's not that's at not at issue here. Um, eight, single family dwelling and the accessory dwelling unit installed there and shall be held in the same ownership. Right. Okay. It's going to be held in the same ownership. Um, the only, I guess the only uh, question I have is just, it's 591 feet, I can, I can read the plan, but if I'm looking at the dimensions mm -hmm. um, correctly, which I may not be, it looks like it's 28 by 24. 24. Correct. I don't know, I don't know how to calculate, but is that 591? No, 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 it's over 591. That is over 591, but in the upper left-hand corner of it's probably easier to look at A, A2 because it's a bigger plan if you're not already there. <laughs> A2 is a blown up plan of the apartment itself. Yeah. Um, the 28 by 24 includes the stair and the landing, which is not, a lot, is, not, is not required to be included in the 600 square feet. Meaning the stair to get up to the apartment itself is not included in the square foot of the apartment. That's exterior to the apartment. Correct. So, which uh, which I went over with with Ben. Yeah. Okay. So you're right that 28 by 24 is more than 591. But when you take out that landing, we actually included the closet at the top of the landing, the the coat closet basically. I, we did include that as a part of the 591 actually, just not the landing itself and the stair that goes down to the mudroom. So it'd be like, I'm just, I'm just doing a little swag here, but so <laughs> it's like 28 by, I don't, I don't see a scale on this bill, 28 by quarter inch. 20? Um, yeah, not, yeah, maybe Maybe a little more, something like that. And what we what we were told to cal cal calculate too is the exterior. It's t two things actually: the exterior of the exterior walls, the landing side of the closet before you enter the house, the outside walls that are actually on the landing and stair side as you go up the page and around the toilet in the, in the shower. Mm -hmm. And then as you go to the back of the closet, the, the, the stair side of that, which is the left, all the way up to the exterior wall of the northern thing. So that's, that's where the 591, that's okay. why it's that. Chair, I have a question or two. Um, on map A3, uh, I only raised this because on other on a previous application this came up, and it was about a heat of that day. It's the height of the structure. Yes. On this height of this on A3, can you represent what the height of the structure is? Yes, I'm sorry about that. Uh, yeah, the, the walls themselves are... 17 and a half feet from grade at the old ocean house side, which would be represented in the north elevation at the bottom, which would be up to the, to the roof. And then we would add another 12 feet. So it would be 
27.5 would be the height of the, of the peak of the roof right. on both of them because they match. So that's, and we're allowed 35, so we're seven feet below that. Uh, uh, yes, it looks like the terrain on SP2 is fairly flat with maybe a one or two foot drop either way. Yeah. So if, if, if there was a slope to the land, that, we, that would be a potential concern, but I don't think it is here, so we can move on. Yeah, it's right. It's, if it is, it's maybe a few feet to something like that, two, two to three, which would put us at 30, 31, something like that for height. I mean, if you averaged it, I guess, is that what you're getting at? I, yeah. I just, it was, you answered my questions earlier. I oh, okay. A, a movement, <laughs> moving on to my next query. Okay. Is that, presumably, the permit wouldn't issue if this is right. going to exceed the height. I'm the 30, right. Yep. 35, yep. And so on uh, SP2, again, the, the, lay, the overlay of the proposed septic field, and it, it looks like it goes into, into the setback. Yes. It's allowed to be within 10 feet of the property line? The, you're talking about the septic field itself? Yes. Yes, it's allowed to be within 10 feet of it. And there's no um, overlay. Is it an overlay issue that we've talked about? Well, I, I own property in town, and, and we have a particular issue with that uh, arrangement. Um, but I think oh, with the, the, the wetlands issue for us. So that, that's not a, a, there's no. Right, there, there is, there's no RP1 wetland here. The, the whole lot on the zoning map is actually shown in the RP2 wetland zone. And, and that, that's very common in town. The RP2 wetland zone is scrawled recklessly <laughs> all over the map. And, uh, and which is why we rely on professionals to uh, go out and do a delineation mm -hmm. and show us exactly where the RP2 wetland is on the site. And, and they've done that. And there's plenty of upland area. Thank you. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you. Um, is there any, anybody else? Anybody else on the board have questions for the applicant? OK. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, I don't think we're going to have any public comment because there's nobody else here. <laughs> <coughs> so we'll move past that. <laughs> public comment um, to the board of discussion. Um, it seems like everything that we've heard, at least from my view, everything we've heard meets the uh, requirements for the creation of an accessory dwelling. with respect to the request. I would agree. Uh, I agree. Somebody like to make a motion? Uh, I, I, I would move. Can I ask you a question? I'm, I'm sorry. Oh <laughs> um, how many bedrooms does the house will the house have including the four system? total four total and what's the yeah and the uh, HAT like 200 head has I guess there's different uh, gallons yes designed for a th is this designed for a three the three bedroom bed for the house and then an apartment bedroom I guess has 30 gallons more a day than the, th the bed bedrooms in the house so actually that's a little bit of a writing error, I guess, in my, the, the, my application when I hand wrote it said 360. If you look at the HHC, it's actually 390 per day. Yeah. So but it's just, just, just to clarify, three bedroom house, one bedroom accessory unit. Right, exactly, yeah. I assume you've, you've reviewed this, Ben, the HHC 200? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the delay. Hi. I move to grant the request for a conditional use permit to construct an accessory dwelling unit as part of the construction of a single family dwelling per section 19 7 5 of the zoning ordinance at NAP R02, lot 10-1, 5 Old Ocean House Road, which property is owned by Candace Karn. 
I'll second it. And any discussion on the motion? Okay. All in favor? So that motion passes five nothing. I'm going to read the findings of fact. Um, one, this is a request for a conditional use permit to construct an accessory dwelling unit as part of the construction of a single family dwelling per section 19 7 5 of the zoning ordinance at map R02, lot 10 1 5, Old Ocean House Road. The applicant is Michael Chestnut, architect. Two, Candace Karn is the owner of record of the property at 5 Old Ocean House Road, map R02, lot 10 1. Three, the lot at 5 Old Ocean House Road is a vacant conforming lot in the RA zone. The zoning map shows most of the lot in the resource protection 2, RP2 district, but a wetland scientist has delineate, delineated the area of the RP2 district on the property. The resulting RP2 district is significantly less than that what is shown on the zoning map. Additional findings of fact, the proposed use will not create a hazardous traffic conditions when added to existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. Two, the proposed use will not create unsanitary conditions by reason of sewage disposal, emissions to the air, or other aspects of its design or operation. Three, the proposed use will not adversely affect the value of adjacent properties. Four, the proposed site plan and layout are compatible with adjacent property uses and with the comprehensive plan. Five, the design and external appearance of any proposed building will constitute an attractive and compatible addition to its neighborhood, although it need not have a similar design, appearance, or architecture. And six, the applicant has demonstrated compliance with the requirements in section 9-7-5.B of the zoning ordinance. All in favor of the findings of fact and additional findings of fact? It's five nothing. Uh, thank you. Um, any communications with the zoning board? Hearing no communications, um, a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? We are adjourned.